Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the October 16th meeting of the Board of Supervisors. We could begin with a roll call, please. Good morning. Supervisor Leopold? Here. Kunitri? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. And Chair Friend? Here, and this morning we are going to start with a moment of silence and a pledge of allegiance, and we would like to uh, honor Judge and former County Supervisor Jeff Almquist with our moment of silence, and Supervisor Bruce McPherson, if you wouldn't mind saying yeah. a few words. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Judge Jeff Almquist uh, was a very, very special person, a very admired and respected uh, attorney, county supervisor, and most of all, a judge. Um, he died unexpectedly at the age of 70 with his, um, his wife and uh, his children in uh, Lyon, France. On a, you probably have read about it, I'm sure. Um, he um, was just a special, special person for this community, and he did so much for us, uh, not only in his private practice before he became a county supervisor from 1996 to 2002, and we had a celebration with the Felton Library groundbreaking just a couple weeks ago, and that wouldn't have been possible if uh, Jeff Almquist wouldn't have stepped up years ago and said, hey, when there was discussions about cutting that out of the system, uh, Jeff Almquist says, no, it's staying, and it did. So we have him to thank for that and so many other things, but most of all, his, his expertise, uh, his knowledge of the budget and of the law and how he handled himself in court. Um, he uh, was uh, appointed uh, as uh, a judge in the early 2000s. He was at the Watsonville branch for eight years. And um, that was the time when there was a budget crisis and there was a consolidation in the courts and that had to be done. And he was the one that stepped up and knew about the budgeting process and whether things could fit and do the best for those who uh, need that service uh, in our county. Uh, he loved uh, family and juvenile cases. Um, he understand, what, as one of his colleagues said in family, that he, his family law, he knew it inside and out. He understood the value of bringing people together. And uh, he liked it because, as he said, I can make a difference here in changing and making, improving the future for, of people in that, that court setting. Um, he um, just never gave up, and he and his wife, Julie, uh, good friends of so many of us, um, they were there where they wanted to be. He was going to retire in January. Um, and uh, they were in Lyon, Fran France, on a Road Scholars uh, tour. And uh, it just had so, so suddenly, but uh, I can tell you from emails that I've received, and I'm sure some of you have too, that she is as strong as can be. Um, and uh, he is going to be coming back here today, I believe. And I think the services are going to be in early November, probably November 3rd. I'm not sure exactly the time and place, but uh, I think it might be, well, I don't know yet. So I just wanted to say, um, you know, there's a lot of special people in our community through the years, but the way he handled himself was with such dignity and, care, and caring all the time. Um, I'd just like to have us remember him. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Please join us in a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Palacios, are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, Chair Friend, there are no corrections or additions to the agenda today. Thank you. Uh, we'll now begin uh, with public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors, as well as any comments you'd like to make on the consent agenda, or if you're unable to stay for the regular agenda, any items that you'd like to speak to on the regular agenda, you'll have uh, three minutes. Please feel free to step forward right now. Good morning, anybody like to address us? Good morning. Good morning, Chairman, Supervisors. The uh, Colorado government, governor uh, mentioned about regional authority. I attended an AMBAG meeting this last month. 
Uh, he says this regional authority constitutes the most violent attack on the American constitutional way of life that has ever been made and as it will grow, if unchecked, will develop into the bitterest issue which the American people have encountered since slavery. When I attended this stealth shadow government <coughs> uh, in Corlitos, uh, there were only four copies of the agenda. I noticed out, out in front here, we've got a stack. There must be 30 copies of the agenda. Now, Ambeg, mind you, the people, uh, Ambeg is three counties and some 16 or 17 cities, yet they expected only four people of, from the public to show up. Community TV isn't there. We've asked Mr. Caput and other people that have attended these to demand community TV. They make decisions. In fact, they, they lobbied the state legislature. The people up here that we represented weren't there to okay that lobbying of the state legislature and the people here were not apprised at all that you were lobbying the state legislature on their behalf. This is a illegal, awful fraud that you're perpetrating on the people. Um, the censorship comes from Leon Panetta and his gang, uh, nothing happens in the Tri-County area without the Panetta machine and Packard. We find Zach Fran, we find uh, 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 Mr. Coonerty, and we also see that Mr. Coonerty was sent uh, by his Marxist father to the London School of Economics. Here from the, uh, was put together by Patrice and Sidney Webb. They founded the Fabian Society, regional government. There's their pamphlet on it. They imposed it in 1942. The very emblem of the Fabian Society is a wolf in sheep's clothing. They believe in deceit. That's what they're putting over on the people here with their regionalism. Um, in addition, the censorship of Freedom Forum that's, that actually has a, a, a candidate tonight this coming Wednesday. Z uh, Mr. Zach Friend and Mr. Leopold made uh, threats on the Grange to can cancel a speaker uh, from them. This censorship comes from the Panetta machine. Jerry Voorhees, a progressive during 1942 when this regional stuff came out, had attacked the cartelization of Europe. He wrote a book, Beyond Victory, meaning that their intent was to create these Soviets war worldwide and then connect them into a world government. That's exactly what AMBAG is and people like Bruce McPherson know it and you know that Cecil Rhodes, by the way, has a secret will uh, together with Rothschild. They formed the round tables. They formed the Council on Foreign Relations and Trilateral Commission which run this country. Uh, the, the setup of foundations in this community is running the nonprofits. These people don't represent you. They represent the very rich Thank hiding you. their tax, their money and foundations. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome morning, back. morning. I, I just want to remind members of the public real quick before I pivot into my public comment what it is to be good, a good flag waving Americans because we are good people. Santa Cruz County is really good people here. So I want to be able to, to wave that flag because there's a lot of anti-Americans that are just uh, festering. But I want to be able to say this. I was able to, to peruse uh, the consent calendar and I want to be able to share with members of the public according to the Brown Act, and members of the public can go on Santa Cruz County Grand Jury and Google SoCal Unify Elementary School District and the Brown Act. This shows you what public meetings are supposed to be about. And when it comes to the consent calendar, this is the only county in the, out of the 58 counties that don't allow members of the public to participate in the consent agenda. We can't pull things out out of that. When you watch, go online and you watch Capitola, Watsonville, and Scotts Valley, and the rest of them, right, that do do public meetings, they allow members of the public to pull. They don't have to grovel, and they don't have to sit here and, and beg. Chairman Friend, members of the public divert their income and their labor to support your leadership. This is happening under your leadership. So I wanna ask you a question. Are your staff here so I can talk to them, dialogue with them? Do, are your staff available or do I gotta go hunt them down? We should be able to pull things off. And when members of the public come up in here and do the, the public comment, you guys shouldn't be commenting on anything. You guys are constantly violating the Brown Act. When it, when it, when it, when it serves your objective to comment on their stuff, Right, because I've been asking for community justice and none of you guys step to the plate. We all know that, hey, people of color are not getting their fair share when it comes to community justice. You know, I, I got sick. 
I had high blood pressure. And I want to be able to thank uh, Madam of the Clerk for being mindful, asking Victoria, Victoria, how are you feeling? She was mindful, because other people came and advocated for me, right? I go to the Dominican checkpoint, right? And I didn't get out to about three o'clock, and I was beeline to the court, and then they put a warrant out. I'm the American most wanted in Santa Cruz County, and that's shameful. I'm not ashamed. I'm used to being oppressed. You need to stop this. And I would say, Chairman Friends, st step to the plate, man. Step to the plate and, and, and go. You fund the DA's office and go and kick that door down and tell them, hey, stop oppressing them. I have a right to my First Amendment. I have a right to peaceful protest. I can't even pull anything off the consent calendar. Ellen Timberlake, right, I go to her, uh, to the GA office because I'm being oppressed in Santa Clara County, and yet they want to deny me services over there. Then when I go to the director, she wants to deny me hearing me. Public comment, I can talk about anything. This is what public comment is all about, right? The American public and the threat from down below were tired of the abuse of political power. There's mounting tension that's threatening the political and social order, and the American public is not happy. I'm not happy. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Thank you. It's good to see you all again. We uh, just wanted to, we were, in, we were planning to be here in greater numbers, um, and I think that people are stuck in traffic to, on their way here now with signs and all that, so there may be a, 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 a wave of gratitude coming at you all today. So I just wanted to say thank you for working together with us uh, to preserve Second Story, really hearing us out, taking time to, to discuss and deliberate. It, you have, I think that it's just the spirit of collaboration and trust in, in public officials and in the, in, the, in, the, in the public themselves when we come with, a, with an open hand that it's often received and you, you all really spoke strongly and, and, and passionately and we're all really grateful. There's a, we were able to sit, to have a miracle donor come from nowhere to save Second Story and now, and now, I mean, we don't even know where to begin with that, but it's, it's happened. So we now are in the house steadily and, and building. The beautiful part of this is that now, now that, now that this, this sort of, this threat had happened is now we're activated and we're seeing that activism can be important. So now we're gonna look at how we can sort of bring our community together, the peer community, the provider community, and the family community, how we can be a collective voice to work with, with you all to achieve the things that we need in mental, and mental health and behavioral health. The signs are here. <laughs> Thank you all so much. It's, it's, it really has become a, a huge blessing, and to whoever the donors are out there in the world, but you know, and we'll find a way to repay this in, in many ways. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Erica Miranda. That was my boss, Adrian <coughs> Camp. He's speaking for a second story. Um, I didn't prepare a statement this morning because I just wanted to speak from the deep gratitude that I have. Less than a month ago, I was up here talking about um, how difficult my life had been and how partially working at Second Story had helped me rebuild. Um, and I honestly didn't have a lot of faith that anything would happen. I really appreciate everyone taking the time to listen to us, not only here, but at the mental health um, stakeholders meetings and at your district meetings. That's so important. I know that behind the scenes there was a lot of work done, um, particularly at the Mental Health Advisory Board. And I just really wanted to thank everyone. And um, of course, we don't know who the donors are, but we very much appreciate it. I kept walking around thinking someone believes in the job that I do to the tune of millions of dollars, you know, more than a million dollars. So that um, is just very meaningful for me and all of the peers that I work with because mental health recovery is possible. It does happen. Um, and as we recover, we help other peers recover and then the system recovers. And I think that's a beautiful thing, um, especially in this age of tremendous political division. Every time I come to the Board of Supervisors meetings, I learn new things, um, usually very, uh, you know, um, 
and I guess what I have to say is just, I really appreciate the job that all of you do. I know that it's not easy. I know that you don't hear a lot that a lot, but um, I appreciate it. I couldn't do it. <laughs> so thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Hi there, I'm Tracy Kennedy, and um, I just wanted to make sure I came and acknowledged all of your guys' um, efforts and willingness to listen and meet with us and um, do what you could. And I know that, um, as Erica said, it's not an easy job what you guys do. And it wasn't an easy thing to um, stand with us at times. So I just wanted to acknowledge that um, you guys really took the time and um, really heard us. And I'd also like to thank whoever our anonymous donors is. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Ridge, and I'm here to thank you as well. Um, I work at Second Story, and um, uh, I've, I've never been to these meetings um, except for this recent fight, and um, I didn't really believe in the process very much, and um, I see it can really work, and I see that um, there's hope. And um, thank you guys so much for all your work. And um, anyhow, thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning. My name's Jessica Brown and um, thank you. Thank you for being here and hearing us each time we showed up. I know there was a lot of emotion. I cried. Um, and, uh, at constituents meetings, local mental health board meetings, and you welcomed us each time as hard as it could be to hear people unhappy and, and really advocating and then hearing people from the community. So um, thank you to our donors. Thank you supervisors for being here and doing such wonderful hard work. Um, I too have um, recently just found like a new hope in being a part of our local government and, and change. And um, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> and, uh, Can I? I, I, I just want to add before our next speaker uh, that I just want to uh, share my admiration for the advocacy on the part of uh, the folks connected to Second Story. Uh, they. Uh, They've done incredible work and it is a great model. And it's through your grassroots efforts of making sure the community knew what was at risk that allowed uh, an anonymous donor to come forward uh, and provide funding so we could have this program uh, over a longer uh, period uh, and, and not have that uh, threat of closing the program uh, upon us. So I just, uh, uh, I appreciate your efforts uh, I look forward to uh, a, a, a continued successful program for Second Story, and, um, and it's great to see the community rally so hard around a program that does so much. Yeah, and I just want to thank you. You were incredible advocates and really teachers. I think you taught us all about the value of respite and the value of this pro peer based program um, in a way that I sort of, I think many of us knew abstractly, but we didn't understand what the day to day was. And it was your, your testimony um, and your life experience that really made a difference. So thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning. Um, thank you, Chairman Leopold and Coonerty. I would, uh, Becky Steinbrenner from Aptos. I would also like to congratulate the group on their excellent advocacy. I have a friend that I took to Second Story, and I have firsthand seen the value of that program. So thank you. Thank you to all of you. Um, I also want to thank you for uh, the great improvements. It's a minor thing, but a huge thing. Um, out in the parking lot, the county vehicles are no longer parked in uh, almost 20 spaces of the two-hour visitor parking lot on Tuesday mornings. That makes a huge improvement for finding a space and the public being able to get here on time. So thank you for that change. Um, 
I do want to also um, agree with uh, Victorious about the um, difficulties in public being able to pull a consent agenda item. I have asked four times to have an, an item pulled and each time it was denied. So it's not working well. I don't know the real reason behind doing this, but I would like to consider, ask your board to consider revoking that change in policy. I do want to thank you, Supervisor Leopold, for bringing it back to the board in, in six months from the approval date for reconsideration. Thank you for that. On the consent agenda today is item 25, which is rather um, a nebulous thing, setting a public hearing on November 20th, but it's really a major thing, and I think it's not well described in the agenda what these code revisions would mean. What it is is the near-term enhanced density bonus that are cherry-picked items from the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan and the um, code modernization, both of which require require an environmental impact review, but these cherry-picked items are being called exempt. It would allow developers to do ad hoc planning in our county, and that was the word of our, our really good commissioner, Mr. Guth, uh, at the Planning Commission meeting when they heard that. And um, it would allow developers to decide essentially where these enhanced bonus areas are combining districts would be. It would not restrict them to within the urban services line, which is appalling to me. And I really want you to look at that when it comes your way. It would also allow developers to defer paying their developer fees, so there would be no money to pay in advance for the impacts of their development. That's not a good way to plan for infrastructure to address the impacts of development. And finally, um, because I'm almost out of time, I just want to uh, ask again that you, th when this public hearing comes, that it is fully described what it is for the public and well noticed. And um, also, my communication regarding Thank you. Uh, 5G has never appeared you. in your list of communication in the board packet. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning. I also want to thank um, First for Story for your advocacy and um, explaining the problem were you to lose this program. Uh, others of us advocate for health and well-being as well. And I wish I could hold up a thank you sign for stopping the rollout of the wireless microwave radiation in this county. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I can't do that. What I want to focus on, and also uh, people not being able to address items on the consent agenda, I have this awful feeling you are like the kings of the county. And we, as you referred to us last meeting, are like your customers. I feel like we're kind of like lower citizens or serfs when you are supposed to represent us. Consent agenda items you have written are items that have something like no need for discussion. Well, that's inaccurate. Many of them need wider a discussion, and you know it. So this is a form of censorship, and I note that mainly Becky and I, and there are some others who speak regularly on consent agenda items because we feel this is important to put in the public eye. I feel this is very anti uh, democratic, democratic, and people ask you to remove an item, and you won't do it. That's quite undemocratic and censoring. What I want to ask you to do is to take legal action to stop PG&E's massive tree cutting butchering the beauty of Santa Cruz County going on private property to supposedly prevent fires. PG&E's history is one of causing fires, not preventing them. 
They are not in the business of safety. They are in the business of profit. And this is devastating to um, the wildlife. The trees are the lungs of the earth. The shade we need, global warming, I think will increase here without the trees. And um, we need you to take action to stop this. pg e has a history of harm from San Bruno to smart meters to Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant, smart meters on and on. Thank you. Please take legal action to halt pg e Thank you. Anybody else like to address us during public comment? Good morning, welcome. Thank you, uh, John Dietz. Uh, I'd like to end on a positive note. <laughs> Thank you very much for supporting the sustaining of uh, Second Story. Uh, you listened to the voices. It took a lot of courage to stand up and work this because it's not exactly uh, a favorable issue in this county, trying to solve homelessness, but the impact of what you did is going to be felt for many, many years. So it's a personal thank you from the volunteers who uh, do the uh, uh, housing of homeless. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. Anybody else like to address us briefly? Welcome back. All right. Good morning. Good morning, board and uh, the public and staff. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Binding. I'm the manager of the Mosquito and Vector Control under the Agricultural Commissioner. And I have two invitations. The first one is to uh, just remind uh, the public and uh, yourself that uh, there's an ongoing tire drive that we've collaborated with, uh, the Agricultural Commissioner has collaborated with Public Works and the cities to, uh, uh, to uh, get an exemption for uh, taking uh, waste tires to the dump. And so if, uh, if the public has any waste tires until this Saturday, through this Saturday, they can take them to the dump up to five tires, up to 36 inches in diameter, and uh, uh, the dump will take them for free. And if you have more than that, then uh, uh, Public Works will be happy to issue you a voucher. Uh, the second invitation, um, I brought my friend Ben up here to uh, remind you that our open house is Friday, October 26th. And uh, Ben will be there, and I hope you will be too. Uh, the invitation goes out to Assemblyman Mark Stone and his staff as well. Um, and uh, all our ex-employees, uh, I, hope, I hope a few of them will be there. And uh, the residents of the public who have any questions about, um, are, are mosquitoes a risk in Santa Cruz County? Um, are they coming from the street drain? Are they coming from down the street? Are they coming from the marsh down, uh, two miles away? Are, are ticks a threat? Is Lyme disease a threat? Is hantavirus from rodents a threat? Are we, is there even a, a hazard, a risk from, from plague in the county? So uh, we can answer all those questions. We'll have our equipment and our, our very well-trained staff, and it's our chance to give back to the community who uh, support our services. Uh, we were quite surprised at the, at the uh, county fair when we did a survey that there's still a lot of uh, the public that aren't aware that uh, we're controlling mosquitoes, yellow jackets, and that we offer programs for inspections for rodents, and, uh, and we do fly control, and we can even give information about uh, how to get rid of unwanted skunks and, and raccoons and, and things that are, er, anything that's biting you. So you can bring in a bug <laughs> if you want, and we'll be happy to identify it. And uh, thank you very much, and we'll s hope to see you Friday the 26th from four to seven. It'll be Halloween theme. And we'll thank you, Paul. As well. Yeah, thank you, Ben, and thank you, Paul. <laughs> I'm sure Assembly Member Stone appreciates having a rat and welcome him back to the county. Uh, all right, is there anybody else that would like to address this during oral communications or public comment? No? All right, we'll bring back to the board to handle consent. Uh, Supervisor Caput, is there any item you'd like to comment on for the consent agenda? Okay, thank you. Supervisor McPherson, good morning. Yeah, item uh, 23, I'm just uh, happy to see this. Continuing our efforts to address the homeless services uh, need that we have in our county. Uh, it's not just in this county, it's throughout the state and the nation. Um, and it's, it's a difficult issue, as we all know, to get a grip on, but we're, we're doing a, a, a coordinated effort, and I, I really appreciate the work of the uh, Human Services Department and also to see about, the, uh, or to learn about the downtown streets team 
and how successful it has been to this date, and I think it, we're gonna have some expansion of that, possibly up in the San Lorenzo Valley. And uh, I just wanna thank those who are participating in it. I went to one of their meetings. Uh, they're energized. These are folks, the homeless folks, a lot of them that are cleaning up our streets, and we're putting them to work, and the downtown merchants are cooperating in making that happen. It's uh, a very, very positive step in this, very, uh, this crisis that we have with homelessness here and throughout the state. So I just wanna thank the Human Services Department and others who have done this, and I'm looking forward to seeing that program expanded. Um, item number 26, uh, this is talking about public litter and recycling containers in Boulder Creek. Uh, that's garbage cans, folks, and that's been, we've been trying to get a, a grip on this with a cooperative effort between the Boulder Creek Business Association, the county, and the state, because Highway Run 9 runs through the middle of Boulder Creek. I think we're going to see some success and some real progress after about five years of it trying to address this problem. So uh, it's, it's coming, and uh, I just wanna thank all of those who have put that effort into making uh, the Boulder Creek community that much more presentable. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Good morning, Supervisor Coonerty. Hi, good morning. Uh, similarly, on item number 23, I just wanna t thank Ellen Timberlake uh, and HSC, uh, sorry, HSD, uh, for their support of the downtown streets team. The streets team is one of the most positive things uh, I've seen in my time in Santa Cruz. It's a win-win-win for the community, uh, and it's really incredibly beneficial in the fact we've been able to expand it and make it sustaining uh, as going forward is really uh, it's really a wonderful thing and that expansion will benefit many lives as well as the community. Thank you, good morning, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. Uh, just one item to come on and one other comment on uh, item number 25, which was the uh, a previously mentioned public hearing that we're setting for November 20th, uh, around these questions about uh, new tools uh, around affordable housing, density bonuses, et cetera. Um, I asked uh, the community uh, activists to hold a, um, a community meeting so people could find out more about this. That's gonna be tomorrow evening at seven o'clock at Simpkins. It's a chance for people to become better aware of some of the things that are being proposed uh, for our board to consider on November 20th. And I encourage you to come out and find out more about it uh, if you're interested in this subject. Um, the other thing I just want to say is I want to express my uh, uh, deep appreciation to the Parks Department and all the community members who came out on Saturday for the groundbreaking for Leo's Havens and Chanticleer's Park. It was a wonderful celebration um, in, in which the, it, this park is really a community park uh, uh, it, because so many people have contributed uh, to it. And we're still offering the chance for everybody to contribute by voting for Measure G, uh, which will uh, be the last part of this. Uh, but uh, it was an incredibly positive uh, celebration. It was great to see so many people out there, so many service clubs, so many individuals involved with this uh, all-inclusive park uh, that's gonna be located in Live Oak. So thank you to Parks and everyone else who was involved. Uh, thank you, I have nothing to pull and nothing to comment on. We just have a, need a motion at this point. I move the uh, uh, consent agenda. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll move on to our first item of the regular agenda, which is item six, which is a presentation by Assemblymember Mark Stone regarding the state of the state. Uh, each year, Mark Stone uh, has been generous with his time to come in here and give us an update on everything that has been going on at the state, and it's been remarkably busy over the last 12 months, and we appreciate all of your work on behalf of our county, and we welcome you. Uh, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. <laughs> three minutes. I'll speak. Uh, try to speak quickly. Thank you. It's very nice to be back in front of you and, and in this chamber. I spent a number of years here and worked with a lot of you for a long time, and I'm very happy to be here again. So we have had a pretty busy session. As you know, sessions run for two years, and they Assembly especially is elected into those two-year cycles, so we finished the full two-year cycle. And a lot happened in those last two years. We were able to focus quite a bit on housing and transportation, which I know are some key issues to you, as well as, as trying to figure out how we can best invest in California, and especially Californians who are struggling. The economy's turned around over the last four or five years pretty significantly. But as it turns out, it's, it's turned around in very specific areas, like Silicon Valley is doing pretty well. 
even though they, they have their challenges with housing and, and poverty even in their own midst. But you go to Central California, really east of a lot of the prosperity in California and people are still very much struggling, which is why we've been trying to invest in programs that help the poorest of Californians. A number of years ago, we put an earned income tax credit, California's earned income tax credit together, and this last year expanded it to try to reach more people. And we've been trying to find ways, working with United Way and others, to, to ensure that people know about that so they can start to draw down those funds, because as those funds are available, as the state has money to be able to pay those, the, the more successful the program is, the more people draw down those funds, the better for them, but also, it helps show the value of programs like that. So we're continuing to work on a lot of that outreach. As you know also, we passed the gas tax, which has seen a little bit of controversy, but has also seen a tremendous amount of benefit to local jurisdictions across the state. That money is starting to go out, and we're seeing a lot of projects that are being built under Senate Bill 1, under the, the gas tax that was put together. And even though gas prices have risen, risen very, very significantly since that was passed, the gas tax is only a very small portion of it, and yet it's providing a significant benefit uh, across the, the state in areas that, that need it. Part of my frustration with the proposition system and, and what we see right now is a lot of my colleagues who rail against it are still out there at ribbon cuttings for projects that the gas tax is funding. So politics as usual is politics as usual and, and we all love to see the money spent even though we quibble about the sources of it. But a, an ongoing sustainable source of revenue for transportation, guaranteed to go to transportation under the constitutional amendment that was passed last June is something that I think is very beneficial for California. That was a struggle. That was three or four years of work to put that together and pass that on a bipartisan basis. Some of the other big issues that we've had a chance to work on, climate being one of them, California now has cemented a 100% goal for renewable energy over the next couple of decades, which is a significant step. And because of what's happening on the federal level, California was able to step into a void that had been created and really showcase what we've been able to do around climate and work with jurisdictions around the world. As the climate is changing and as carbon increases in the atmosphere, the ocean is doing what the ocean does and is absorbing carbon. Now we're starting to see some very detrimental effects, effects of that because the acidity level of the ocean is changing slightly, which will be devastating to our fisheries industry uh, and our coastal economy, coastal habitats that we see. So we started with Washington and Oregon, a, an ocean acidification task force that is, an in, that is internationally based. And we started with maybe a half a dozen countries. Now there are, I think, 200 countries who have signed up, almost 300 different jurisdictions, including states, who are part of the, the discussion and, and are seeking to be part of a solution uh, on a global basis. So even though we're just a little state, little state, we're the, right now the fifth largest economy in the world where we are our own separate economy, but yet even though as a subnational jurisdiction we have some significant clout and we've been able to do that because of the policies we've passed, because we've had a very strong leader in our governor over the last eight years and a real commitment that goes down even to the local level. I know your commitment to the environment, to the strength of the economy, to chant, to really trying to find solutions to the changes in the climate and, and adapting your areas of responsibility. And it's from the local level all the way up, it's that commitment that allows California to ultimately really be out in the forefront of, of where we need to be. On other environmental challenges, we have had a little bit of luck. We passed sort of the first step of a straw bill that is voluntary, but at least raised a discussion about the impact of plastic straws. Not so fortunate on a number of other bills trying to address plastic pollution as we, we know where we know where the challenges are, but statewide policy becomes difficult. So we are looking to local jurisdictions, as Santa Cruz County has done, to step up, do the hard work, pass some of the, the ordinances necessary to limit plastic pollution, and then that provides a bit better of a model for the state to work off, because if more jurisdictions are stepping up, then we get increased pressure at the state level to address some of these issues. In fact, we just saw that this year, it was kind of 
in the weeds and not very talked about, but we've been pushing for a pharmaceuticals take back, both pharmaceuticals and sharps for a number of years. I know Santa Cruz County has addressed this years ago and has been really in the lead trying to move policy. Well, the state, we finally got to the legislature last year, take back program on pharm pharmaceuticals and sharps. And it was not a big attention getter, because it was done sort of fairly quietly. It was one of those things that needed to be moved through the process, very open, very transparent, but not a lot of flamboyance around it because we had brought together a coalition of partners, including the pharmaceutical industry, finally, willing to take some responsibility. So we'll see how that gets implemented over the next number of years, but that's gonna be an important piece. On the health and human services side, also, quite a bit has happened. I, I know you saw the debate over the single payer, which died sort of a painful death last year, but the legislature has renewed its commitment to finding some, some way of instituting a universal health care for Californians. We know we have the leverage and the clout, given the size, given our population, the size of our economy, the amount of money that's available from a number of different sources to bring to the problem. So we will be taking that pretty seriously over the next few years. Not knowing who the governor is, although we're, I think, fairly confident who the governor is, and if it is Gavin Newsom, he has committed to universal health care, so we know we're going to be having those conversations and figuring out how we implement that. On the human services side, you know my work in the foster care system, the child welfare system, I've been very fortunate to work with a, a significant partner in Will Lightborn, who was the director of the Department of Social Services. And we're eight, we, we put together one of the largest changes, beneficial changes for kids in probably a generation or so. That is and isn't working. We're on track to have it. it. It went live last July and a lot of the pieces will be implemented come this next July. But some of the pieces that we've been trying to put in place like mental health services and all aren't quite there yet. So we're trying to see if we can do a better job supporting kids at risk and have a, a process that is continually looking at itself, working with counties on what's working and what's not working. And I hear from our counties about what's not working and what is working, and we're able to take that into account as we move that policy forward. So it's a pretty significant change, and I think in the long term it will also be very instructive on how we do other policies around kids at risk. As if we can do better for this population, those in the child welfare system, those in and out of foster care, then we can also start to expand that and know better how things work when we're dealing with homeless youth, sexually trafficked youth, and others who tend to fall through the cracks. We have a pretty strong dependency system, pretty strong delinquency system, but those are kind of the two, ca the two silos that kids fall into when we try to provide some benefit to them other kids tend to fall through the cracks, and that's something that California really needs to do a much better job on. Some other bills, I know there are some of my friends here from the Golden State uh, Manufactured Homeowners uh, League in California, and we finally got through, thanks to them, a very significant change to the, the mobile home residency law as you know, because counties get involved in mobile homes and the state has some responsibility and counties have some responsibility, it becomes very difficult. Nobody as of yet, there's no state agency that helps enforce the mobile home residency law. So it's left to the owners to try and seek redress if a park owner has violated the mobile home residency law. And there's very little ability to do that because these are some of our best affordable housing, which means a lot of people who live in manufactured homes don't have the resources to go to attorneys. Well, the park owners know this. And so they push back and now we're creating a program with the Department of Housing and Community Development to raise some money that is being funded by the mobile home owners, the manufactured home owners themselves, and to try and level the playing field and have a venue to hear some challenges to the mobile home residency law. So this is one of the first we've been trying to do things like this over the last number of years. In fact, the governor vetoed this same bill a year ago, and we told him it was a mistake, and we pointed out his mistake, and we negotiated with him about how to implement this, and sure enough, we put it back on his desk, and he signed it. But again, this is the kind of thing that really worked because of the organization across the state of those who live in mobile home parks and want to have 
a, a, a venue to have their, their issues heard. That's kind of, to me, politics at the best. It was absolutely grassroots and made it very difficult for my colleagues to say no in the end. And what had been very controversial kind of went through with a little bit of a whimper this year, and not a lot of, of pushback and opposition because I think the good folks across California, part of the Golden State Manufactured Homeowners League, wore out my colleagues and they had no place else to go. So it was a, it's a good policy, it's a strong policy, we're gonna learn from it over the next few years, but it's something that provides a significant benefit. And the other one that seems like a, a bit of a lark that was kind of fun to do was a monarch bill. And so now we've got a fund of $3 million and a program to benefit habitat for monarchs in this area. I know how important it is to Santa Cruz, Pacific Grove, to the Central Coast to have that iconic species. But more importantly, restoring habitat for the butterflies also restores habitat for native bees and other pollinators that are suffering. We're seeing a real decline in the ability for the ag industry to get the benefit of native pollinators. And the bees we have don't pollinate all the crops. So we have to be more responsible. So that's a value I know that, that you share, that I learned a lot about land conservation and things we need to be doing in my time here in Santa Cruz County and get to translate that at the state level. And we moved something through that was beautiful and interesting because it seemed to be about monarch butterflies, but yet had some very, very other significant impact on the agricultural community and kind of how California's natural systems work. So that's a bit of a snapshot. I think we're in pretty good shape. The budget in California is very strong. We have reserves and we've had a surplus over the last few years. And thanks to the rainy day fund that the voters passed, we have been putting more into reserves. And even last year, we found a few other reserve categories. So even though California's budget was the largest budget from an expenditure standpoint in the history, just shy of $140 billion, we have more reserves in the state of California than 38 states have general fund. So we're, we're an expensive state to operate, even though on a per capita basis, we have one of the smallest governments. If you look at the number of individuals involved in government, we don't have a bloated government, but we have a large population that's expecting a lot of help and services, whether it's infrastructure, health services, human services, or the like. So we have that buffer against the next economic downturn, which we know will be coming at some point. That's what we've been able to, to build up. So with Jerry Brown and his legendary tight-fistedness, we have had a pretty healthy back and forth between the legislature and the administration on what our budget should look like, what our priorities are, what we see as investments in Californians, and what we see as ongoing programs or even one-time programs. So we were able to, I think, put together some pretty strong fiscal health. A lot of uncertainty now with the next administration on what the new governor is going to be like. Uh, as I said earlier, I think we probably know who that governor is, but what we don't know is what that governor's cabinet will look like and who's gonna be in what places. And for those of us who deal with various cabinet departments in various roles, that obviously becomes very important as to what initiatives this administration is going to want to do or not do and what their budget structure is going to look like. I have personally have not been through a transition like this before, so it will be interesting and I look forward to the, the next couple of terms, obviously, if the voters allow me to go back and continue to work on a lot of the issues that I have worked on and transition into hopefully a very successful four years, potentially eight years for the next governor. And I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Assemblymember Stone. Uh, any questions from board members? <coughs> uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, thank you, Assemblymember Stone, for the work that you do and the way in which you represent Santa Cruz County uh, and the state legislature. Uh, your work uh, on uh, with foster youth con continues to be a great beacon um, uh, for the work that we that we've done here in Santa Cruz. But uh, the way in which you've helped uh, reshape that system uh, has an effect on young people throughout the state. And uh, it's it, not too many people know about the the foster youth system. And so uh, the, the the work that you have done uh, really has affected the lives of a lot of kids. So thank you for that. Um, uh, when it comes to the issue of health services, 
Uh, I know you've been a strong advocate for good public health, um, and I'm glad to hear that, that the legislature is gonna be taking up, uh, could potentially take up something with the new governor around universal health care. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but we know here in Santa Cruz when we provide health care for all kids, that kids do better, that they are in school more, that their parents are allowed to be at work, they do better. Um, and so the idea of having health care for all people in, in California will make a big difference in just the, the success of the state. Uh, so I wish you good luck in uh, trying to figure that out. On issues of the environment, you are clearly an environmental leader. Uh, uh, I note that you were maybe the, one of the few, if not only member of the state legislature who spoke at the recent climate change conference uh, in uh, San Francisco uh, that uh, our governor put on uh, because our president doesn't believe in climate change. Um, and I thought that, that that conference was a great way of showing the, the, uh, the work that we're doing here in California. We're gonna be hearing uh, uh, later on the, this morning about uh, our Monterey Bay community power and how that's making a difference in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we, we've tried to do lots of different things here in Santa Cruz to uh, leave a lighter footprint on the earth. And um, uh, I hear you pretty clearly that uh, sometimes we're gonna need to, uh, to push for changes from the bottom up and not wait for uh, solutions um, uh, coming from Sacramento or even Washington. And when it comes to things like plastic pollutions, which you have been a great leader on, uh, on this board when you led the, the board uh, to, uh, uh, to ban single-use plastic bags, uh, and now we have uh, uh, legislation at the state level. Um, we're looking at other plastic pollution uh, issues uh, that uh, we can address here as a way of uh, creating the momentum to, to look for um, uh, uh, a, a statewide solution, um, and hopefully it can be modeled on, on the kind of good work that we might be able to do here in Santa Cruz County. Lastly, with housing, I, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about your mobile home bill, but uh, as someone who has 33 mobile home parks in uh, the first district, um, which is the single largest source of affordable housing in Santa Cruz County, um, providing the, the, the tools uh, for residents to be able to access their rights and to uh, achieve justice um, and having a, a method to be able to do that uh, is incredibly important. And as I go out and meet with uh, constituents who live in parks, who are dealing with um, uh, an owner who uh, doesn't share the same values that we all do, um, knowing that now there's gonna be this ability to, um, uh, uh, to seek redress in a way that it's actually affordable and accessible will make a big difference. The last thing I wanna say is you made a, 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 it was interesting to hear your remarks about the statewide budget um, and uh, to realize how much better shape we are in than we were six, uh, eight years ago or 10 years ago uh, when things were pretty dire. Uh, here at the uh, board, we tried to uh, build up after um, uh, the Great Recession to strengthen our financial foundation. We too have increased our reserves. Um, and we've tried to reduce cost. And I just wanna acknowledge your leadership in helping pass a piece of legislation so the county uh, could uh, seek the same kind of revenues that cities have. Um, you know, as you know, here in Santa Cruz County, half the people live in the unincorporated areas. And so in addition to all the county services, we have uh, a lot of municipal service requirements. And so with the legislation that you passed um, just a couple years ago, uh, we now have a measure on the ballot uh, that has uh, built a lot of great support. We're, we're hopeful that people will vote yes on Measure G, um, uh, but we wouldn't be able to have that opportunity to have that conversation with the public if it hadn't been for your leadership uh, to get that bill passed. Um, we're really excited about the opportunity and we're hopeful that it will be able to provide the resources to provide the services that people care about here in Santa Cruz and have told us they want. So thanks for your ongoing work up in Sacramento. Thank you, and, and on the housing piece, I'm also glad to see the county working to pass its own measure. We have the legislature put two measures on the ballot around housing, and a lot of it seems like a drop in the bucket, if you will, but with local jurisdictions stepping up as well, just like becoming a self-help county with transportation, that's gonna be increasingly important for the state to be able to give resources down to the local level to really 
provide the services that you need. And every county looks different than the next as far as where the population is. It's one of our challenges doing housing policy at the state level, I will admit, because a lot of it's driven by much more urbanized areas who have a different vision for what's possible and what resources are available, and we're certainly resource constrained. So the more that local jurisdictions are stepping up, taking affordable housing seriously, then hopefully that's less for the legislature to impose things that make it very difficult to be able to manage the decisions that you have to make here. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I uh, certainly want to uh, repeat the, the uh, comments and the thanks for your services, especially with human services, foster care, and the environment. It's um, really, it's unmatched, I think, in the legislature, and I just want to thank you for your efforts in, in those particular areas, but uh, so much more as well. Uh, but, um, you know, the, you mentioned that the California's in a stable economic position, and that's, that's great, but that uh, puts, and you have a, a rainy day fund, but I, uh, as we do, there, people, there, it puts more pressure on people wanting more. I mean, how many people have asked you for less? or us, no one. So uh, that's always there, and uh, we all, it's there for a reason. I, I just wanted to maybe mention, um, as a, it, in attending the executive session of the California State Association of Counties, uh, two things that they're concerned about, that we don't have a repeat of the state being in this good financial position, that they start um, lapping on some of these unfunded mandates that have been repaid, thankfully, but I uh, hope we don't get in that position again. And so it's, uh, that's a, a real big concern for counties uh, throughout the state. And uh, then the uh, in-home support services issue that's complicated. Uh, it's a mixed bag of uh, a lot of people being engaged in this from laws passed from years ago, but uh, just to how, how we can stabilize that and again, and. Uh, provide the services that are so much in need. I know you understand that, but uh, just so you know, at the CSAC Executive Committee meeting, those are two of the issues that really came up and said, boy, that's a big concern to us. So, and, and those are both very good points, and I keep telling CSAC, and I know you and I have had this conversation about staying engaged with legislators, especially those who are former county supervisors who understand a lot of these issues. We do a number, any number of unfunded mandates, it's kind of, what goes along with the, the relationship here, but we do try to be sensitive to that, and so understanding, staying connected with you and understanding what those implications are as we're looking at policy is very important. And I'm glad you raised the IHSS. The current administration has not been, sort of sees that program as an expense on the state budget, but if you really understand how all those pieces go together, it's ultimately a savings on our overall system. And as we look towards universal health care, making sure that we have the most effective and efficient services for those who need it is going to be very, very important. And I'm hoping the new administration will take a better look and understand the value, the investment that the in-home sports services really represents as part of our health care system and treat that sector with a little bit more respect would be beneficial, but also then we could then recognize the savings to the healthcare system that those workers really bring us. I'm thinking we'll have a better conversation over the next number of years around IHSS, but yes, that has been sort of a stepchild, if you will, passed between the state and the county, and that's not good for the system, and it's not good for those who rely on that level of care. Supervisor Coonerty. Hi, uh, Assemblymember Stone, thank you for coming and thank you for your good work, uh, especially advocating for foster kids, but really understanding the needs of local government and being a strong advocate. And thank you for having really good district staff that's incredibly responsive to both us and the constituents uh, when, when we call your office with concerns. It makes a big difference, as you know. Um, there's, and I think uh, following up on your IHSS comments, I think there's an opportunity for us to partner and you often I think, and we appreciate it, point to Santa Cruz County as, a, as an incubator, as a showcase. We have some really good home visiting programs right now where we're matching first-time low-income moms with public health nurses from the, from the time they find out they're pregnant through the child's second birthday. We're seeing incredible outcomes for the moms, the babies, and savings for the system. Uh, a lot of states uh, reimburse home visiting as, a, as an entitlement under their, their versions of Medi-Cal, um, and I think if the state could move towards reimbursing 
making home visiting a reimbursable uh, um, uh, activity under Medi-Cal, we could not only improve lives, improve things in the community, but we could save the state and the county a lot of money in the long run. And so working with you on that activity as well as, and as we talked about, uh, maybe giving local governments the ability to increase tobacco taxes so that we can um, fund some of these early intervention programs. Uh, I, think, I, think, I think that's a way that we can partner and really have Santa Cruz hopefully be a model that other communities can follow going forward. I should also note that Monterey County has also implemented the home visiting program uh, uh, as well, and so they're seeing great results as well, so you'd be able to showcase the whole region um, going forward. And I think I've, given your commitment to kids and given your commitment to smart investments, I think, I think it's an opportunity for us to work together uh, on, the, on those two initiatives. I would absolutely agree. And of course, it's not entirely true, although sometimes I talk about it, that a lot of the changes we've been able to do in the juvenile justice system come out of Santa Cruz County with Judy Cox, Scott McDonald, uh, with the, the current probation. She sort of that structure that's put in, in place, as well as a very thoughtful sheriff and, and the way Santa Cruz translated juvenile justice into better outcomes for the adult justice community. The same thing, I think, with the, your ability to do innovative programs, show the cost savings, and with Monterey involved, those are the kinds of programs I think we can start to say, yeah, look, it works. And we can show you how it works, and this is why and where it saves money. And drawing that connection between the expense and the savings down the line is difficult, as you know, in government budgeting, but it's going to be critical if we're going to truly make a system that functions. The big question for me right now is what the next cabinet's gonna look like and yeah. who's gonna be interested in. Some of these issues, the current Department of Healthcare Services really has not been that interested in. And with the new governor, depending on who he puts into those positions, I'm hoping that we'll be able to revisit some of these interesting and innovative ideas that, that get healthcare down to the lowest levels where it can be effective, and efficient, save us money over time, but really get into the communities that need the help the most. That'd be great. Thank, thank you, and I look forward to working with you. And as always, because we're all gonna hear about it, is uh, you know, working on mitigating the impacts of university growth uh, on the community and the yeah. LRDP. Hopefully we'll be able to work at the state and local level to work with the UC system to come up with something that's sustainable for our community. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Caput. Thank you. And welcome back, and you're doing a lot of work to help us locally. All politics uh, are local. It's an old saying, and uh, you're, you're doing a lot of things here. And uh, it's already been mentioned, the work with human services and housing and everything. <coughs> so uh, that, those are very important issues here locally and uh, probably nationwide. But. Uh, the one interesting thing I found, too, was uh, your interest in the uh, monarch uh, habitat. And uh, the, the short story on that, the monarchs do start out somewhere in Canada and keep traveling down, and they end up in uh, Mexico and farther. Uh, not, it's kind of a crit critical habitat if we have to, you know, make sure that we don't ruin it in our area and also Pacific Grove and other areas. Um, when that, that money, some of it, I guess, would be, uh, we could try to get some of that money locally to try to protect the habitat here and maybe even expand it. <coughs> but uh, I think there's, uh, the milkweed is something that they, uh, that they have to have and uh, one of the seed companies is actually in Felton that, uh, that actually does that. So uh, what, what, uh, what, how would that money kind of be used to protect habitat, maybe expand it? I was thinking maybe even uh, county landscaping, city landscaping, they can go out and plant whatever, you know, is also good for the uh, monarch. Uh, potentially, the fund right now is $3 million. The state has started the fund. It's all being done through the Wildlife Conservation Board and they're gonna to have to come up with rules about prioritizing various projects and hopefully that money will attract some private sector money in to grow that fund as well. Primarily, we did allow for 
habitat for overwintering, which is what we see around here. And local milkweed and other kinds of plants is primarily milkweed for the monarchs. But other kinds of plants are fair game to talk about. Most of the money probably though is gonna be spent in the Central Valley where the milkweed habitats are, the riparian habitats are that support these butterflies as well as the, the pollinators who use the same habitat. So we're looking to work with large agricultural areas, individuals interested in restoring or getting technical assistance to help restore or manage some of their areas where the butterflies go. They overwinter here, but they go into the Central Valley to feed and to reproduce. And for that, the milkweed is absolutely critical. There are large tracts of habitat that's been degraded and taken out of habitat. It lost its habitat value. So that's, that's really where the money is aimed, as well as ensuring that we have the overwintering sites here. But so smaller projects potentially could be available for landscaping and things, but I think what we're trying to do is leverage larger scale projects to get back some of the Central Valley habitat that has been lost over the years that has directly led to the loss of, we used to see tens of millions of butterflies, now we see a few hundred thousand. Uh, right. The population loss has been really significant. So we have yet to see exactly what projects are gonna qualify. There will be, I'm sure, some large ones and some small ones, but the $3 million is not a lot right now, and we hope for that fund to grow. And we wanna make sure, I think the Wildlife Conservation Board is going to make sure that the projects get the most bang for the buck, if you will, and provide good habitat restoration. And a lot of that will be Central Valley. I'm glad uh, that you, you know, showed some interest on, on that and the educational part to the public. Uh, uh, like I know in Mexico that like 40 years ago, they considered the monarch almost like a pest down there. Uh, they, didn't re uh, they didn't realize that it, it could become a, a huge uh, tourist attraction now. And uh, that's uh, in the last 30 years, they've been trying to protect and uh, also expand uh, the you know, monarch population down there, which travel all the way from Canada, which is quite an amazing journey. Uh, so, uh, the other would be uh, uh, the tree, uh, the trees, we got to be very careful when we're, uh, you know, we got to make sure we have uh, trees for these monarchs. I guess they, in the Santa Cruz area and also Pacific Grove, uh, they happen to like the eucalyptus trees, I guess, in that area. So. Yeah, and those eucalyptus sort of a, in its own way, a bit of a large weed. Uh, non-indigenous species, but yeah, they do provide, because of the density and where they're specifically located, they do provide habitat, especially here in Pacific Grove. I don't know that it's quite, they rely quite so much on the eucalyptus, but there are definitely eucalyptus that are down there. Right, and, yeah. uh, and, the, and again, it's a tipping point. If you get too low, like you said, there were millions and now there's hundreds of thousands, but uh, if it gets to uh, too low, it, it could, you know, lose the whole thing. At some point, yeah, the population could crash and we could lose them all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'll just throw this in. I maybe, uh, uh, we're dealing now with PG&E on whether or not they, how many trees they could cut in certain areas. Uh, again, we have to be careful on everything and that's why we like local control. All politics are local, so anyway, thank you. Right, and unfortunately right now, probably PG&E has removed more trees than we're talking about restoring through programs like this. So it's very frustrating to see the sort of slash and burn mentality that they have right now. So I, am, I appreciate the county. We've been, appreciate Supervisor McPherson's office working with us and seeing how we can kind of put the brakes on, on what they're doing and uh, the sort of whole scale destruction that seems to be happening in our county and in other places. Um, yeah, so it's been very frustrating to see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, Assemblymember Stone, as Congressman Farr used to say, everything has been said, it just hasn't been said by everyone. So I think at this point, I will actually give an opportunity for the community who have been waiting uh, very patiently to come up and, and sing your praises because of the remarkable work that you've done on behalf, not just of our community, but across the entire state. Many people may not. Uh, necessarily know how their lives will be made better because of the bills that you've carried over the last few years, but you have you. significantly improved the lives, especially uh, of those that are least fortunate among us in this state, both from uh, kids and those that, that live uh, with limited means. And so we'd like to open it up for others who would like to uh, spend a couple minutes speaking. 
you will have uh, three minutes. Good morning. Mr. Chairman, welcome. Good morning. I'm Henry Cleveland, Chairperson of the Santa Cruz County Manufactured Mobile Home Commission, and with me is Gene Brocklebank, the Vice Chair. I want to thank you, Assemblymember Stone, for uh, helping the Santa Cruz Mobile Home residents while you were here sitting on the Board of Supervisors. I remember you from then. I appreciate that you took some of the philosophy and practices of government practice here into Sacramento, and I'm glad you're having that effect there. Your entire legislative career is commendable, but today we want to congratulate you specifically for your Herculean effort to enact the Mobile Home Residency Law Protection Act, the formal name of AB 3066. This took years of skillful, skillful effort to overcome the opposition of the mobile home park industry and even of our own governor. And as you said, he vetoed it once. Your diligence turned that veto into a resounding success. For decades, mobile home residents in this county have had access to government support to help them support, uh, to protect their safety and welfare while living in their mobile home parks. With your AB 3066 becoming law, mobile home residents now throughout the state will have some assistance too. This crowning achievement led the Santa Cruz County Manufacturing Mobile Home Commission to issue our first ever Legislator of the Year Award, and I now turn the mic over to Jean Brocklebank to, to present the award. This is for Mark Stone. Whereas the Santa Cruz County Mobile and Manufactured Home Commission is chartered to advise the Board of Supervisors on matters related to mobile home living, and whereas the County of Santa Cruz has an interest in promoting the social and economic well-being of its senior citizens, low-income families, veterans, and others in need of affordable housing, and whereas fair and equitable treatment under the law are essential to maintaining the viability of mobile homes as affordable housing, Whereas Santa Cruz County mobile home park regulations have demonstrated the vital role government can perform in providing equitable treatment for mobile home residents and park owners. Lastly, whereas the passage of Assembly Bill 3066 due to Assembly Member Mark Stone, Stone's tireless efforts makes this fair and equitable treatment under the law available to mobile home communities in Santa Cruz County and throughout the state. Now, therefore, the Santa Cruz County Mobile and Manufactured Home Commission does hereby proclaim Mark Stone is the Commissioner's Legislator of the Year, and we have given you an embossed proclamation to keep Mark. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 am, I am truly honored, but the work really was done by the residents across the state, the pressure that they put on. And one thing to point out, which I appreciate all this, but the bill right now, because of what we had to negotiate with the governor, only provides to the relief to manufactured home owners, not the residents. So those residents who are renting the unit don't necessarily get the same benefit, which just means we have more work to do. Yeah. That, that's true, and I might add that those who do own their homes sometimes share a park with those who don't. Yeah. And so those that do can actually help work. They can. We will, yeah. Yes, we, we will make this work. Yes. And we will ensure that as we learn how this develops and how effective it can be, that will give us the impetus to make the changes necessary. So sometimes you need to put your foot in the door, yeah. stop it from slamming, and then go all the way in. And we will thank definitely you. do that. So thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else like to step forward? Yes, please. My name is Michelle Smith. I'm president of uh, Golden State Manufactured Homeowners League. And I have just got a few words to say to uh, Assemblymember Stone. Please know that you have the sincere thanks of over one million mobile homeowners. Um, we basically, I feel privileged to present you with, um, let me try to pull this out appropriately here. But it's gonna go, go in the bag with you. GSMOL's Legislature, Legislator of the Year Award as well. And um, we've got a lot of GSMOL members in your district, as you know, some of them are here today. 
And here are a few of the attributes that we considered in making this decision to recognize you. You stand up for our state's most vulnerable residents, like mobile homeowners who are primarily comprised of seniors, veterans, disabled, and low-income families. You understand the plight of those of us who own our homes with significant investment in them, and sometimes it's our last and largest investment. Yet we live in communities which we love, but we rent the piece of dirt that our home sits on. Well, a piece of land, we love the land. Um, these days, many family-owned parks have been changed hands and are now owned by corporate investors who want to make the highest dollar on their land as possible and see mobile homeowners as, as cash cows. Since affordable housing is becoming harder to find, it's even more important to mobile homeowners to receive consumer protection due to the fact that we're living in a captive market. Finally, mobile homeowners have not been able to depend on any state agency to assist us with the enforcement of the mobile home residency laws. That has all changed now because of the great work that you have done and accomplished by passing AB 3066. So again, I know we've got um, one of our associate GSMOL uh, managers here. We've got a couple of board members. So again, thank you so much for the work you've done. We really appreciate it. And uh, there's one more little gift in there. I thought you might want to have a matching shirt. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, I, I must, since Michelle is here, and we've spent quite a bit of time on the phone as we work through this, we've tried, I've tried bills in the past to address some of these issues to benefit the residents. And usually we can't get them out of even the first housing committee that we got them in. That, that we have to face in the assembly. And about four years ago, I think, I actually got a bill out of the assembly housing committee, much as chagrin of the lobbyists for the park owners. In fact, she was so frustrated, she was in tears <laughs> because she was expecting it to die. And we got it to the floor, it didn't pass the floor, but that's the kind of control they expect to have. And it's the grassroots mobilization of the residents and the manufactured home owners themselves that have really got us to this point. So I thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us on this item? Good morning, Becky Steinberg. I'd like to first ask if there are any other members from the mobile home that want to make a presentation. I don't want to interrupt the flow. All right, thank you, thank you. That's a really great thing, and thank you, Assemblyman Stone, for your good work to help these people. I would like to, along that line, ask that um, you make it possible for mobile home owners who do own the land under their mobile home, there are a few of them, to be able to apply and be eligible for um, the state property tax postponement program that's being heralded uh, here in this county as a relief for those um, in Measure H, the um, affordable property tax bond. And, uh, but mobile homeowners are not even eligible to apply, so I'd like some work on that to help these people too. Regarding the monarch habitat, I think one of the single most important things that we can do in this state is to ban neonicotides. That has been shown to have a devastating effect on um, butterflies and all pollinators. I work in the nursery trade and we actively search out uh, suppliers that do not use this because it is well known that they have a devastating effect on populations. If you can do anything to ban the use of those, that would be Herculean and much appreciated. Um, I would like to also ask you for your assistance in the issue we're having here in our county with PG&E deforesting our roadways. Um, there are some big issues in what they're doing with that timber that they remove that are uh, violations. And I understand it's being handled at the Sacramento level, but anything you can do to pressure PG&E to instead of deforesting and removing the, the lungs of the earth, removing carbon, um, to instead update their technology. Uh, Mr. Kevin Collins has spoken to this board and provided information to the PUC about the technology that can be put in that would immediately disconnect any sparking that could happen and therefore remove the danger of the fire starting from PG&E down wires. I would like to also ask your help in the 5G rollout um, that is putting without any um, jurisdictional oversight the um, towers and things for the telecommunication industry. 
I would also like to ask your help with the um, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act that uh, local jurisdictions be able to update more easily their place of use water rights amendments. In this county, that would mean a huge um, improvement to a regional solution for the groundwater overdraft in the mid-county area rather than shoving us forward into the very intensive energy using reverse osmosis technology. And finally, I would like to ask your help with the UC system being required to house 100% of their students as UC Thank Davis you. has been required to do. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Good morning. Thank you for waiting. Good morning, Chair, friend, and members of the board. I'm Ellen Timberlake. I'm the Director of the Human Services Department in the county. And I'm actually up here today to thank you on behalf of all the families and youth in the foster care system in Santa Cruz County, but also across the state. If I could, I would declare you the legislator of the decade. <laughs> I'll, I'll make you a t-shirt, I promise. Um, I had the good fortune 10 years ago to sit with you when you were a supervisor on the first systems improvement planning process in Santa Cruz County where we took a hard look at the experience of individuals coming through our system. And who knew that a decade later you would be leading one of the most, if not the most significant reforms in the child welfare system. The only thing in my last 10 years that I've seen that tops the level of impact is really the Affordable Care Act. And I cannot thank you enough for your leadership in bringing forward the continuum of care. You are already changing lives in this county. We have fewer kids in group homes. We are wrapping supports around our families with the mental health supports that you've helped to create. We have a long way to go and we will incrementally improve it, but I cannot thank you enough for that vision that has ultimately changed the lives and will continue changing the lives for families and from this point forward, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Timberlake. Uh, good morning. I would also like to ask your help on some environmental issues. And um, you spoke well, and I'm also for health care for all or Medicare for all, so I'm glad to see you advocating for that. Um, regarding PG&E, I agree with you. This is utter devastation of the tree cutting. And um, I know you know Kevin Collins. Perhaps he's in contact with you on this. But um, this is um, massive degradation of our county. Perhaps you have seen the base station in Scotts Valley where there are about 100 tree cutting vehicles and I hear it's about 30 boom trucks. It's like a, a military camp and pg and &E, my friend in Felton the other day, met one of the tree cutters who said he's there to mark the trees to do a four cut radius around all the power lines. Um, and there are about 5,000 miles of lines in the state. Um, and then he told her that somebody else is gonna come and mark it for, I think, um, a 10 foot or 12 foot diameter. This is huge. It needs to be halted. We need your help at the legislative uh, level. And PG&E, I, I, I don't think they have authority for this. They certainly don't have a safety record on in their whole history, you know, the Aaron Brockovich film and um, chromium-6 contamination of Hinkley, California, the smart meter roll off and roll out that making people sick. Um, just today on the bus, I'm talking to someone who is telling me how sick she is from the smart meter radiation from where she um, lives um, and memory loss, not sleeping well, headaches constantly. It's just a haphazard conversation. Um, also, we need your help in stopping the 5G uh, onslaught. There's never been 
a safety test at all on the 5G millimeter wave technology. And I wanna give you some literature here, mobile communications, the cause for the global disappearance of the bees, also related to the disappearance, the decline of the monarchs. A talk by Martin Paul that the board has also Thank received. You. So we need your continuing. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak to us on this item? Is this the last speaker? Okay. Good morning, board. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Assemblymember Stone. My name is Seth Smith, and I'm with Santa Cruz Veterans Alliance, and I'm a resident of Santa Cruz. Uh, we're one of the licensed organizations here in the state uh, for production of cannabis and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, retail sale of cannabis. Uh, our production facility is in the city of Watsonville, and our uh, dispensary is here in uh, Soquel in Santa Cruz County. Um, to our knowledge, we're the only licensed group in the states that, that has continued a compassionate care program for a specific medical population uh, since uh, the beginning of the year uh, when Prop 64 took effect. Uh, we know that you supported, along with our uh, senator for this community, uh, supported uh, SB 829, the compassionate care bill, and we very much would like to thank you for that support. Um, that would have allowed us to write off the taxes on the cannabis that we donate for free to our veteran population uh, that does possess uh, doctor's recommendations. Um, unfortunately, we're still paying that tax. Uh, we've paid that tax since we started paying taxes several years ago. Um, we'd like you to hopefully uh, join with either uh, Assembly Member, or I think it's Assembly Member Wiener from San Francisco, or State Senator Wiener from San Francisco who introduced that uh, legislation, or potentially join with uh, your colleague here uh, from our community in the Senate to introduce similar legislation in the next uh, session uh, of the State Assembly. Um, and we hope that uh, uh, Governor Newsom will, or potentially Governor Newsom will support that. Um, we'd like to thank the board for all the support that you guys have given us over the last uh, several years. Um, our facilities have been inspected by the Bureau of Cannabis Control, the CDFA, uh, CDPH, uh, CDTFA. We've passed with flying colors every time. They use this as a model for other uh, uh, producers and uh, dispensaries going forward. Um, we're hopeful that we have the opportunity at some point to uh, either open new dispensaries and new locations so we can spread this mission uh, a little further across the state. Uh, we get people from all over the state, veterans from all over the state that drive to us every month, uh, over 100 to 150 veterans that come see us. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to uh, work with you uh, in your office uh, in the new year to, uh, to help us out. And we'd like to welcome you and any members of your office uh, to come to our facilities in uh, Watsonville and here in Santa Cruz and see what we're up to and, and what it really looks like on the ground. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. So Assembly Member Stone, uh, we'd like to close with, uh, the board thinks it's unfair that you get to do those really large framed proclamations all the time uh, and then tell us you don't have any money to give back to us for anything. I, I, I use but the money that would be otherwise allocated to the county. Trust that, us, yeah. we, we know. Um, but in response, actually the board itself actually wanted to do a proclamation to you uh, on behalf of the board, not just for 3066, although that is the focus of this, but in general, as, as a line in here says, for that you've proven yourself to be an advocate for social justice issues and helping California's most vulnerable residents. We are in a really difficult time across this country right now. Remarkable divisiveness across the entire world. Uh, but even in this current economic expansion, nine in 10 people actually have their wages lower than they did at the beginning of the economic expansion. Uh, so there's a large net that's needed within our community and within our state. Um, and I shudder to think what'll happen when you turn to a recession if right now is what's considered good. Yeah. And you have uh, taken a lead on that, both in the protection of affordable housing as it currently stands on the mobile manufacturing home component and through your votes to expand affordable housing throughout the state, your work for vulnerable populations and senior and children. This is a small token on behalf of the county, but I think that there's uh, 57 additional counties beyond ours that would appreciate the work that you've done too. So thank you, Assembly Member Stone. On behalf of the board, we'd like to give you a proclamation. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for your patience this morning. Thank you, and the board will take a 15-minute recess until 10.45, and we'll come back for item seven. <coughs>
bring back into session the Board of Supervisors. We're gonna move on to item seven, which is a presentation of Gold Beacon Award to County of Santa Cruz by Institute for Local Government, as recommended by the Director of General Services. We'll have a brief introduction, and then we're gonna uh, receive some awards, and it's actually uh, pretty remarkable that we were able to receive these. Good morning, welcome, Ms. Johnson. Good morning, Chair Friend, members of the Board, Carol Johnson, excuse me, from the General Services Department. I'd like to introduce Carol Lee Brown from the Institute of Local Government. She's here to present your board the Gold Beacon Award and some Spotlight Awards for your efforts in improving our local environment. Carol Lee? Yes. Thank you for coming down. Oh, you're very welcome and I'm happy to be here. Good morning. As she said, my name is Carly Lee Brown and I'm a manager at the Institute for Local Government. I manage the Beacon program there. For those of you who do not know, the Institute for Local Government is affiliate of the California State Association of Counties, the California League of Cities, and the California Special Districts Association. We are also a partner in the Statewide Energy Efficiency Collaborative, along with the four investor owned utilities and two other nonprofit organizations. ILG and the Statewide Energy Efficiency Collaborative created the Beacon Program more than a decade ago to support and recognize local governments and their efforts to save energy, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and create policies and programs to address climate change. The County of Santa Cruz passed a resolution to participate in the program last year and applied and was awarded for a Gold Level Beacon Spotlight Award for reducing community-wide greenhouse gas emissions by 17%. This year, the county documented measurable milestones in the four remaining categories in the program, and today I'm absolutely thrilled to be here to present the County of Santa Cruz with a Gold Level Beacon Award, our highest honor, and four Beacon Spotlight Awards for its comprehensive approach in addressing climate change and creating a more sustainable community. This award celebrates more than a decade of environmental leadership and comprehensive achievements in conserving natural resources, saving money, and creating policies and programs that address, address climate change. In all, the county has documented a 17% in community-wide GHG emissions, a 12% in agency greenhouse gas emissions, a 13% reduction in natural gas savings in agency facilities, a 28% percent savings in electricity and agency facilities, and more than 60 individual activities in 10 separate areas of sustainability best practices. The County of Santa Cruz is just the third county in the Beacon Program to achieve the full Beacon Award, and the first county in the program to receive the award at this prestigious gold level. We were honored last year when Supervisor McPherson spoke at the 2017 Beacon Spotlight Awards in Sacramento, and I have truly enjoyed working with Carol Johnson from General Services and Elizabeth Bertrand from AMBAG Energy Watch. But I know that this impressive achievement was a collective effort that was supported by this entire Board of Supervisors and the County Planning and Building Departments, Public Works Departments, and so many of your community partners. So it is with that that I wish to present this Gold Level Beacon Award to the entire Board of Supervisors, the staff, and the community. Congratulations to you all. On behalf of the Institute for Local Government and the Statewide Energy Efficiency, we thank you for your leadership. And now I have many awards, and there's five awards and five of you. So if you want to each come down and grab an award, I think there's people who want to take pictures. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> You want this one? Thank you. 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 Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this item? 
I'd just like to, to briefly say, I appreciate the comments on a gl more global scale, because when, when you were walking through uh, the reasons why the, the county had received these awards, it is true that actually some of these were individual interests of individual supervisors. Um, you know, I can think of Supervisor Coonerty and his interest in alternative uh, energy for the county buildings. I can think of Supervisor McPherson and his leadership on Monterey Bay Community Power. Uh, but everybody has brought something forward on this, but the work is really done uh, on a day-to-day -day basis by Carol and others, um, Ginny and others on the, on the county staff that have just really made this. And David, I mean, there are people here that really have made this their life's mission to make our county a model on this issue. And as Assembly Member Stone had noted before, you can't always count on uh, other levels to do it. And I think that what we've seen here is that uh, we've done things in the county of Santa Cruz that have become both state and national models, and there's no reason why we should stop now. We're very fortunate to have the staff that we have here in the county that take the leadership on these issues. Thank you for taking the time to recognize us, and uh, thank you for everybody within the county family for taking this leadership role. This really is an award for all of you. So we'll move on now to the, the next item, which is a presentation of, by Monterey Bay Community Power, apropos. Uh, as outlined in the memo of the county administrative officer, I, I recognize that um, uh, Mr. Palacios has been taking a lead on behalf of the county on this item as well. Do, would you like to briefly introduce uh, the speaker, Mr. Palacios, before the presentation? Uh, we've done such great work on Monterey Bay Community Power, and I'm just uh, very thankful to have a representative here from our staff to present to the board and the public about all the good work that we're, we're doing. Good morning, Supervisors. Uh, my name is J.R. Killigrew. I'm the Director of Communications and External Affairs at your Monterey Bay Community Power. Um, before I launch into this, um, I've heard a lot of wonderful comments about advocacy and local control, but this agency is that locally controlled public agency that is serving the constituents not only across Santa Cruz County, but also San Benito and Monterey. It is truly a model statewide that this is the first community choice energy agency that launched as a regional effort. Every single other one of them launched either by a city or a county or whatnot, but this is the first time that three very diverse and dynamic counties got together to launch a program. And this is a model that we can uphold not only the state, but also nationwide as community choice programs proliferate across other states like Ohio and Massachusetts, New Jersey and Rhode Island. Um, just wanted to kick this off. Um, based on my for former colleague, Carol Lee, about the future is carbon free, and we totally congratulate the county and its leadership in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and energy efficiency. Um, MBCP is now delivering 100% carbon free electricity at a lower cost than pg and is right now. So not only are you reducing your energy consumption, but you're also getting carbon free electricity at the same time. Great. So who we are in a nutshell, um, we are a joint powers authority that comprises of uh, 19 local governments, 16 cities and the three counties. Um, we are what you call a community choice energy agency. So we go out on behalf of the constituents here and procure energy on behalf of them. It is then delivered through the pg and &E poles and wires. As I mentioned before, the great thing about this particular Joint Powers Authority is I think it's the first one that's been created in a good 30 or 40 years since AMBAG. So it's really amazing to see that this county, this region was able to get together and put forth another collaborative that's going to help reach not only climate goals, but also economic goals for the region. Uh, one thing that I, I'm always amazed about with this particular program is the amount of community input and analysis and investigation and research that went into it. When you look back to when uh, the region got its grant back in 2013 to the point that we launched service this year in March of 2018, that's five years 
of, of energy and investment into this program. There's not another program in the state that's been able to invest that amount of time and energy, and it just goes to show you the amount of community input and advocacy that went into, but also the thought and the research and the rigor that each one of the cities put forth in order to become a, uh, become a part of this Joint Powers Authority. So how we are governed, and I think I wanna um, uh, highlight the point that we are a public agency, all of our meetings are available to the public. So if you look at our policy board, which is made up of the elected officials, they meet quarterly. Our operation board meets eight times a year, and that, that's made up of uh, administrators as well as city managers. And then our newly appointed community advisory council meets on a monthly basis. We're talking about 24 public meetings just for Monterey Bay Community Power. So if people ever need to come to voice their opinion about things, learn about the programs, there are 24 opportunities on an annual basis that our board meets to share in terms of what we're doing. So in a, getting back to it in a nutshell, what we do is we go out and acquire electricity on the wholesale market, and then it gets dispatched to residences and businesses in the Monterey Bay region. We are in a partnership with PG&E. They do control the transmission and distribution. Um, but ultimately, the big benefit from this program is that we can take surplus revenues and reinvest it back in the community faster and more effectively than PG&E can. Now I wanted to uh, give you a little uh, snapshot in terms of the, the, the revolution that's happening in the state of California in terms of electricity. There are now 20 operating CCAs or Community Choice Energy Agencies in the state. Think about it, in 2010 there was one. It's one of the fastest growing re, uh, uh, I'd say sectors in the, in, the, in the state, but it's all locally controlled and it's community driven. I think it's just a model that uh, I think a lot of other states are looking at to see the benefits and whatnot. So in terms of why MBCP is different, um, in terms of choice, we provide people choice, but they didn't have it before. The big thing is we we're providing uh, carbon-free electricity as our default service. Also, additionally, local control and accountability. We're not taxpayer fun uh, funded, and also we have volunteer board members um, that are participating in our boards. And then additionally, what makes us even more uniquely positioned to help this region is from our local benefits through our rebate model as well as our energy programs. Um, to be able to set across, uh, set aside surplus revenues so quickly to reinvest in the region is another model that other CCAs are looking at us uh, to learn about and hopefully uh, uh, emulate moving forward. Now what's great about uh, this whole CCA model is before this all started, folks didn't have a choice where their electricity came from. They had one option. Now with Monterey Bay Power, uh, Community Power, you have two options, whether you wanna go 100% carbon free or 100% renewable energy. The other really unique program that we uh, put forth is our rebate option. So with our 3% rebate, a customer can reinvest that rebate in either MB Green Plus, which is for local programs, or MB Share to help climate efforts with local foundations. This is truly an innovative model that no other CCA is doing. Now in terms of community outreach, I think uh, our work is never done. We're tirelessly trying to reach as many, uh, many different businesses and residences. Um, some of the, uh, the bullet points kind of speak to themselves, but we have hosted over 140 different workshops and events. And I also wanted to call upon this really unique partnership that we did with Univision to educate agricultural workers. Uh, for the last two or three months, we've been going every two weeks to provide food and education outreach to underserved communities to learn more about what uh, Monterey Bay Community Power is gonna do for them. And it's really been a whirlwind in terms of the, the type of input we've gotten from underserved communities that otherwise may not have been addressed with this program. So I think it's really just a, a hallmark piece of our outreach campaign. Now I did wanna give you, uh, the Board of Supervisors, a snapshot of the County of Santa Cruz by the numbers. So in terms of all the customers in Santa Cruz County, in unincorporated accounts for over 55%. You folks actually have the, the highest enrollment uh, percentage compared to Santa Cruz, uh, uh, Monterey County and San Benito County. And also greatly it's seen uh, a huge uptick in enrollments in our 100% renewable option as well as participating in the rebate options, MB Share and MB Green Plus. Now in terms of what's next, and I wanted to uh, show this picture because this was at the Community Power Festival, which was hosted here in Santa Cruz. So it was another great opportunity for us to engage the community. We had a lot of great vendors, had a band out there, and it was another fun way for us to talk to the community about who we are and what we're doing. <clears throat> 
Now, the, the, the fact that MBCP is already setting aside uh, surplus revenues for energy programs within the first year of operation, we're the first of its kind in that sense. Um, so we're looking at uh, investing funds in EV rebates to help both low-income customers and public agencies. We're partnering with the CEC about a huge $6 million EV infrastructure opportunity, and MBCP is gonna be putting on uh, revenues for our electric vehicle charging stations. We're also hoping to part with the Air District as well to kind of put forth a really joint collaborative to reinvest in this region for EV infrastructure. Uh, we're also looking at hopefully to support low-income installations for solar, as well as doing some strategic analysis around what, what the region will look like if we go fully electric. What does that mean for the transportation sector, the agricultural sector, the business sector? How will that reduce emissions, but how will that create jobs and create a more resilient Monterey Bay? And I think ultimately I wanted to kind of land on uh, where we are moving forward. Um, gonna continue to do a ton of outreach and brand awareness, make sure our customer support is as high as possible. And then finally, our three pillars of our energy programs are transportation electrification, building electrification, and distributed energy resources. So it's a really exciting opportunity for us to be here in front of you to provide you a really exciting update about the impacts that are having already in the region. And I just wanted to, give a note to Santa Cruz County as kind of being the leader to get this whole movement going in the region and the leadership that all the supervisors had in supporting this program. It truly is a locally controlled community-based agency that's here to provide a voice to the residences and businesses in this region that they otherwise may not have with an investor on utility model. So on that note, I'd be happy to entertain any questions or thoughts. Are there any questions or comments from board members? Sure. Supervisor Caput. Uh, when I talk to people, uh, a lot of people don't understand yeah. the difference between uh, what it is now and what it was yeah. in the past. Uh, but they do, uh, the big concern is that they'll save money. Yeah. So uh, in, the, in the near future, it looks like it's going to save money for most customers. Yes, actually, um, so our rates are consistent with PG&E, but we deliver a 3% savings for all customers, so we are less expensive, categorically 100% less expensive. Right, and that's, uh, that's for the electricity use, right? Correct. Yeah, and uh, as most, uh, uh, pardon me for the question, I, I don't understand some of it, but is most of the power generated by these windmills that are out there, or is it uh, there are other sources of, uh, you know, producing the electricity. Yeah, and that's a great question. So our power mix right now um, for our MB Choice, our default product, <clears throat> is 30% eligible renewables. So that's geothermal, biomass, uh, small-scale hydro, wind, and solar. And then the other remaining 70% is large hydro from California to the Pacific Northwest. But if folks are really excited about 100% uh, renewable energy, we have that electricity option called MB Prime, which is 100% uh, renewable energy coming from wind and sun. Okay, and then uh, on uh, solar power, uh, uh, what's the shelf life of, uh, uh, is it 20 years, uh, you know, a, a big solar panel, or is it, uh, are we improving on that? Yes, the efficiency of the panels are, are increasing quite rapidly. I think about maybe 10 years ago, you were looking at about 10 or 12% efficiency. The panels are getting up to 15 to 18%. And then the effective useful life for panels are actually moving up to about 25 years now. And hopefully they'll get longer and longer as, as the technology increases. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson, in case you know something about this. <laughs> yeah, I, I just uh, want to thank, this has been, uh, <clears throat> I love athletic sports and all that. So this has been a great a team effort as I've ever seen in the political, social world that I've, I've been associated with over many, many years. I can't <clears throat> thank enough people that contributed to this cause. And it, initially we were gonna start up with just Santa Cruz County and its four cities. And we said, no, let's, we can do better than that. Let's, let's make it bigger. And we've ended up with three counties and, nine, and 16 cities. I can't uh, thank enough the Project Development Advisory Committee, David Carlson and Carol and others who just uh, really put their hearts and soul into this. And <coughs> the, the formation of it is that much, even that much better because we didn't say, um, 
let's, this is the tar, let's go get it, uh, and then figure out how we're gonna get there. We said, what's the best way to get there and what, the option, what are the options available for us to uh, establish a Community Choice Energy Agency? And we did it, uh, and uh, Scotsman always likes this, as I say, without one cent of general fund money being spent by any of the governing agencies. Uh, there have been other counties that have put as much as seven or eight hundred thousand dollars into that effort. We got state grants, we got uh, help from the University of California, Santa Cruz, the Community Foundation. Uh, this has been a tremendous community effort and people really have literally bought into it. And so I, I can't th I thank uh, those people enough who said yes, this is a good thing to do. Um, let's get the, the roadway of how to do it and let's establish it. And uh, we have a different model as you mentioned and people are looking at the model that Monterey Bay Community Power has uh, developed and it's um, going to be one that's copied I think throughout the state and, and the nation. Uh, we did launch seven months ago and at that time uh, the county uh, and thank you Everybody in, in Santa Cruz County, we put up the up, up front money uh, of over six, uh, it was about six and a half million dollars total, not all county, but, and we thought maybe that'll take about two years to pay off. Well, we have paid that off in seven months. We're debt free right now. So that really feels good to a guy named McPherson, uh, I'll tell you. So, um, and uh, some people, the questions that they have, uh, if you have a solar system, you're gonna get twice the credit. So uh, it's it's a win-win for those who are already in the solar system. Um, as far as our greenhouse gas emission uh, levels of, of attainment that we were set for us by the state for 2030, we will meet those this year in 2019 because of this program. So there, there's a lot of good things. Uh, uh, it's just uh, really uh, the most exciting thing I've been associated with in my public service career, um, uh, frankly, and I think that there has been some confusion because the billing uh, has been, uh, uh, we bill, uh, you'll see Monterey Bay Community Power electric charges on your bill, and they think, well, that's a new, new charge. Well, no, if you go back and see an alike uh, usage of your electrical power, with your bill that was on the PG&E bill for electric service charges, uh, and you compare it to what this uh, th that PG&E charge is, as well as um, the Monterey Bay community charge, this the new one will be less. So it's um, it's a little confusing because it's a new line on a bill, but it's not an additional cost. You're actually saving money, as you you mentioned. So I um, I just can't again overstate how pleased and thankful I am for the number of people. It took 140 community meetings over five years and uh, that came to the table and said, yeah, this is a really good thing on several levels, carbon free, less cost, local governance, and we're gonna rebate and we're gonna reach out to, uh, for the electricity needs of this region uh, and for, for that ma manager, uh, matter, the whole state, but for this region uh, with the electrical vehicles, uh, where we can, we can reach out to those um, in the low income areas, possibly to get them to uh, buy into this. But our 95% um, uh, enrollment with commercial and residential com uh, customers is, or maybe it's 98, I think you said, but uh, it's, uh, we were looking at 85 to 90 maybe, and uh, we, can't, we couldn't be more pleased, but this community has been very instrumental in making this happen and they're, uh, I'm very appreciative of what they've done and uh, the enrollment and the, the confidence and faith they've put in this program because it's gonna be here from now on and we're gonna be uh, really a lot more environmentally friendly than uh, a lot of other regions in the state. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation and thank you for the work of uh, Monterey Bay Community Power. Um, I was uh, very uh, excited to hear about the investment in uh, uh, chargers and our electric transportation infrastructure. I think that that's, we see increasing number of cars on the road. Um, and I think the importance of Monterey Bay Community Power providing some uh, incentive or subsidy uh, for people to be able to purchase the car will be very important. Uh, especially as the federal government, it seems to be withdrawing from this area. So it's, uh, you know, California has to step forward um, in all the different ways that we can in order to, uh, uh, to make it attractive for people to, to change the way that they drive. And uh, once you change, it's, it's hard to go back. 
uh, as the owner of an electric vehicle. Um, I was, uh, uh, I wanted you to talk uh, about this recent decision by the PUC about the power charge indifference adjustment uh, because. Oh, that thing? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, the PUC, uh, Public Utilities Commission, seems more like the PG&E Utility Commission uh, yeah. with, this, uh, with this ruling. Um, and, uh, you know, I've gotten some calls from my office concerned about what's going to happen with our bills, and I wonder yeah. if you could talk about that. Sure, absolutely. Um, I, before I, I, I start, I just wanted to mention I had the pleasure of attending uh, Assemblymember Stone's environmental breakfast, um, sure. and he, he mentioned that uh, when our CEO Tom and Bashi and I were talking to him, uh, we were wondering why is the CPUC in San Francisco? And he, and he let us know that it used to be in Sacramento, but the railroad industry had their ear all the time, so they had to move them down to San Francisco. And now maybe it's a good idea to move them back to Sacramento. <laughs> but in any event, um, so uh, the background about this <clears throat> um, this charge, as they call it, um, it, it's 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 not new. It's been around since the late 90s. Um, if, if folks recall, uh, there were some large industries who wanted to get more affordable electricity, so they departed service from PG&E or SoCal Edison or SDG&E and entered in direct access. And the problem was is it was a considerable amount of energy and the utilities are already procured, so they basically said we need to be made whole so we don't <coughs> have to levy this cost on our existing customers. So I just want to set the record that it's not a new thing. It's been around for a long time. It basically just got reinstituted when Marin Clean Energy started in 2010, because the whole theory is if you're a, a, a PG&E bundle customer, you're getting your energy supply from PG&E, you shouldn't necessarily be on the hook if somebody leaves service and you have to foot the bill. I think it's like, in theory it makes sense, but in the way of the methodology and the practicality, it's getting a little wonky. But I think, most importantly, there was uh, a decision that was made by the by the CPUC to move forward with this alternate uh, proposed decision. But the great thing about Monterey Bay Community Power is we saw the writing on the wall. We did as much as we could to plan for it. And actually what the CPUC has kind of put forth in terms of whether there's increases or decreases, we've pretty much planned to a T. So in terms of our rates and our consistency, there's not really going to be much of an impact for our, for our customers. I think most importantly is to ensure that customers know that regardless if things go up, down, left, or right, you will always get your 3% savings, and that's the way to help reinvest in the region. Just in this ca calendar year, we're going to be putting back, I think, about $3.5 million in the pockets of the Monterey Bay customers. And you know, based on a 3.5 or 3.3% rebate for 2019, that could be another seven and a half million dollars. Right. So we're talking about just in a span of maybe 20 months, this, this, this agency is gonna be putting close to $12 million in customer rebates back to the 270,000 customers that we have. Will people see an increase in their, in their energy bill because of this ruling by the PUC? Well, the, what will, the, not necessarily because the, the generation rate, which PG&E updates once a year, that's where, you would, uh, that's where you would see an increase or a decrease. So case in point, let's, a residential E1 rate is 10.78 cents per kilowatt hour. So what happens is, is if PG&E decides to reduce its rates, then we'll end up reducing our rates a little bit. But if it goes up, that, the, the issue with the PCIA kind of, it squeezes our margin or our flexibility to reinvest in the region, but it won't have an impact in terms of like what the rate the customer so, sees. It would be the generation side. So c customers will, will basically see roughly the same bill. Uh, we'll have less money to be able to invest in local yep. projects because of the PCIA. Yep. Um, and um, the 3% the rebate um, to an average customer, what would that look like? I mean, in, in, you know, in terms of yeah. money or uh, credit on their bill. So the, the way it works right now, and this is completely different from any other program, uh, some other CCAs actually do a discounted rate, so you're 3 to 5% less than pg and &E on a monthly basis. Uh, we took the approach that of what the California climate credit is because customers see a big sizable credit once or twice a year on their bill and there's more of a relationship to it as opposed to a little discounted sure. rate. So for an average customer, 3% um, a month would probably translate to somewhere between 2 to $4 a month and when you kind of aggregate that up on an annual basis for 12 months, you're looking at anywhere from 25 to $48. But then if a customer's average bill is maybe say 100 bucks, that's knocking off 25 to 40% of that monthly bill. 
Yeah, well, I mean, and uh, last I checked, I, don't, I didn't get any rebates from PG&E for all the years I, uh, <laughs> uh, I was uh, their customer as well. Um, I, I really appreciate all the hard work that went into creating this, and um, it really goes to us taking c control of our, uh, of our power system to invest in the things that we care about um, and to do our part to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So thank you for the work of Monterey Bay Community Power. Um, I know there'll be a lot of questions with this ruling, uh, uh, but uh, I thought you, you put out some very clear information yeah. uh, that will be helpful for the public, so thank sure. you. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, I just want to share um, the excitement and the appreciation for everyone who put the time in this, uh, this effort. What has really shown is how much money we were exporting out of this community to, uh, to corporate you know, uh, executives and shareholders rather than keeping it and reinvesting it, giving it back to consumers and then also reinvesting in our community. Uh, and then what we can do when we sort of have our purchasing aligned with our values to, uh, to make sure that we're uh, reducing our carbon footprint and doing our part uh, to reduce the efforts of, of uh, carbon emissions and, and the impacts of climate change. So I want to thank you for that. I think it's going to be, you know, I think every new business or new initiative, it's about communication and about consistently reaching out, and I think you've been doing a good job of that. I think people will appreciate it more as it becomes uh, clear and they start to see the benefits both in terms of the rebate and in terms of uh, energies uh, purchasing that aligns to their values and then eventually in terms of this local reinvestment once we stop having this takeaway uh, at the <laughs> state level. I, having run a business, I would love it if some, every time I lost a customer, I was just got paid regardless uh, for uh, for having lost that customer. Uh, that, that seems like a really good business to be in. Um, but uh, I'm hopeful that the state will reverse its actions and really let the decision making get back to to the people and to the communities um, where they can we can we can be the leaders on the many of the efforts that they're talking about in terms of climate change and local, uh, resilient local economies. So uh, we'll keep, keep pushing that effort forward and thank you to, to you and the whole team uh, for doing this outreach in our community. You're welcome. We'd like to open it up for the community. Is there anybody, anybody that'd like to address us on this non-action item, the presentation? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I do have a couple of questions, and thank you for the good presentation. Um, I, I wanted to ask about that um, statement that it is Monterey Bay Community Power is definitely less expensive. I attended a presentation by uh, the, the uh, Monterey Bay Power uh, representative at a Soquel Creek Water District meeting um, maybe about a year ago. And the question was put to them about whether um, the deep water desalination plant in Moss Landing would be using Monterey Bay Community Power, and, and the answer was no, because deep water desal could get a cheaper rate from Salinas um, at the municipal rate that the city of Salinas would be granted, and I'm just wondering if that has changed. Uh, deep water desal would certainly use a lot of power, and I would prefer to see that it come from a green source, uh, such as Monterey Bay Community Power. My uh, second question is uh, actually a, a comment to the board. With this good, um, clean power source, I would like to ask your board to begin discussions with the county planning and zoning department requiring um, all new development and remodel for both commercial and residential include um, electric vehicle hookups that would us uh, so really help our, our carbon footprint and to encourage the use of electrical vehicles in our county. And finally, um, again, I want to thank you. I just have been somewhat stunned to learn how, um, how quickly this has been so successful to such huge amounts of money, but, but also um, as a very poor family. <laughs> Uh, to learn that the CEO of Monterey Bay Community Power makes $27,000 a month with benefits, to me, was stunning. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us? Uh, good morning, I guess. 
Uh, I just want to briefly say thank you to all the board members for spearheading this project and, and particularly to Supervisor McPherson who took this on from day one and, um, and supported uh, Jenny Johnson who really was the driving force that uh, took us from an idea to uh, a reality and it, it's really, I, I share your remarks, Supervisor, that uh, I've never seen anything quite like it in, in my lifetime that uh, local government could take that kind of action that quickly and involve that many uh, jurisdictions and, and come up with a solution that really uh, benefits the citizens. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kaufman. Anybody else like to address us on this item? Well, certainly you did a presentation that just sounds wonderful. Um, sounds. I have some questions, and I hope you will answer them, or board members, and that I will not be disregarded with these questions like the board routinely does, like I'm not even here. Uh, and I've been discussing some of these points with friends, so responding to these questions would um, clarify for more people than myself. One is, uh, knowing PG&E's uh, really a disastrous, harmful history and their present uh, horrible operations with uh, smart meters, and we just talked earlier about slaughtering the trees of the county. Is there a way to be independent of PG&E. In other words, PG&E is a monopoly. It seems like it would make more sense for really having a community or local operated to not be in partnership with PG&E. I find that part rather horrifying. So that, that's one question. And the other is, um, how do you define energy efficiency? Because we've been told for years about fluorescent light bulbs being energy efficient. Uh, they emit mercury, it's mercury contamination. The flickering is very bad. These LED lights that have been put in when they switched out, my understanding is um, the fluorescent lights, these are also very, very harmful, uh, especially to the vision. Um, it feels terrible to me in this room all the time, but I feel like my public citizen responsibility is to try to give some direction uh, to the board and inform others. So those are um, two questions. And the third one is what part is wireless microwave radiation in terms of the transmission of energy. We know pg e smart meters emit radiation, um, so I would appreciate clarification on answering those questions, because I did see on my bill, of course, there's an increased amount so that's going to be very discouraging for people to see from the Monterey Bay energy. Um, so those are my questions. I look forward to a response from you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address us? Okay, seeing then we'll, we'll close this item. Jerry, if you want to meet with them, I mean, they're here to, if you have, want to answer those questions specifically, the board's going to uh, move on to our next action item. We do appreciate you taking this much time, though, to uh, make that presentation, and, and uh, they're in the audience if you want to pull them aside and answer those questions. Thank you for taking the Very time. Very much. Uh, the board will move on to item nine, which is to consider an ordinance amending chapters 2.08.22.26.34.36.38.66.72.84.94.95.98.2.104.106.111.119 and 120 of the Santa Cruz County Code to simplify language to correct errors and update agency titles and statutory references and make miscellaneous code changes outlined in the memo of county council. We have the board memo. We have a strikeout and underline and clean copy for all of these updates. Welcome back, Mr. Heath. I recognize that you had said at our last couple board meetings that you would be bringing these 
periodically, and I imagine that's what this is. That's what this is. Good morning, Jason Heath with County Council's Office. This is the second in a series of update ordinances that we're going to be bringing your board uh, over time. Uh, this one addresses everything from emergency services to assessment appeals board to workforce investment board. All of the changes that are being recommended here have been vetted with the staff that use these codes and the commissions uh, that use these codes and that uh, implement their uh, their work. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, I know it's a very large package. Um, you know, I can I can be directed to a specific page and tell you why and what the basis was for any of these changes. Um, uh, some of them, because the packet's so large, I may be able. To, I may need to get back to you, um, uh, especially if it's related to a statutory reference change. A number of these changes relate to state codes that have changed, for example, and been updated, and uh, and the like. You're saying you don't have them all memorized? Not yet. It's very disappointing. Very disappointing. <laughs> that's but that's okay. We'll let it slide I'm sure, this one I'm sure time. Our, our county council has it all. <laughs> uh, Supervisor Lee, pulled the other question. Uh, uh, two things. One is. Uh, uh, potential language change. It's on page 63 of the packet. It's in the county administrative officers uh, section 2.08. Um, uh, this may have been missed. Is It says whether he or she deems it necessary, and I thought we were trying to change these to whether they deem it necessary. Yes, that was... Um, yes, that was one of the places where it was missed. So as you can see in the other in the other places, we've changed it to there throughout. So there was there was not purposeful to leave that one as he yeah, or no, she. Yeah, no, I just I, did, yeah. I I figured in a packet this large, something like so, this is going to get. So missed. what I what I would suggest is I note that, and if 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 anyone was interested in a motion to advance this package, what I would do is on my third update ordinance, I would bring it back to just correct that one small change. Um, I've already identified something in one of the other ones that needs to be. Um, modified as well. Um, I, I'm happy uh, to make that happen when the, when the time's appropriate. Um, there was uh, one of the things that's uh, interesting to me uh, in reading through this uh, is I've never sat down and read the code uh, page by page, and so there was an element in the off in the description of Office of Emergency Services or Emergency Services 2.26 um, that. Uh, that caught me by surprise. It, it's uh, in section six, it's on page 70, and it says, in the event of a proclamation of a local emergency, as herein provided, the proclamation of a, quote, state of emergency, unquote, by the governor or director of the state office of emergency services, or the existence of a, quote, state of war emergency, the director is empowered to. Um, the state of war emergency uh, w was very surprising to me, and it's uh, directly out of state, out of state law. It's I mean, it's it's there's a so definition. So in the event that war is declared, that's exactly right. That would come from the state. That's would, exactly right. Okay. It was it was weird to read in our county code about the state of war? Yes, it never be used. So, some of this is some of this is what we're doing is we're trying to align our local code with the state code where appropriate so that we, we don't diverge so much that we end up with differing systems at some point or systems that conflict with one another that then have to be cleaned up over time. Sure. Well, thanks for filling me in about that. That was, as I say, I was, wasn't, I was surprised to read about that when I yeah. read the back. No other questions? I do have a brief question on section 2.0. 38.270, which is the conflict of interest code section. Um, it defines when a commissioner committee possesses that they have the decision making authority. It doesn't go on to say whether they have to, shall have a conflict of interest code. I wasn't sure if this, if the language there, and I don't actually have the page because I'm looking at it as an attachment, so I'm not going to be totally helpful on you. Okay, let me try to catch up with where you are. 2.38.270, which is the conflict of interest code adoption section. I'm almost there. I guess my, I just want to make sure that the language that we have here would facilitate the requirement of a conflict of interest code adoption for our commissions. It's 2.38.270. So, so, 
so what this does is it, it, is it, is it basically incorporates the language of Title II California Code of Regulations, Section 18700. Okay. So um, I don't have with me in this packet subsections A or C because the only thing I was changing from that section, well, I, I don't have subsection A. What I have is subsection B and C. Um, let me look really quickly. Actually, I just don't have it. I don't That's have okay. subsection A. But, but the, the, the idea would be that we follow state law, and, and state law determines when, when. conflict of interest okay. codes need to be adopted. So okay. this co county code provision about conflict of code um, adoption is really more informative and duplicative of state law Understood. than anything else. It's not meant to replace it. That's helpful. Okay. Are there any other questions on this before I open up the community? Okay, we'll open up the community. Anybody have any questions or comments on this item? Item nine. I do, thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Um, first of all, I think it would be helpful for members of the public if on the main agenda, instead of simply listing the code and the exhibit to also, as you do in the other uh, staff report, list the topic of each code change. For example, um, in R, exhibit R has to do with the fire department advisory code and uh, so on. That would um, be in keeping with better government transparency and peak uh, the public's interest in actually researching what these change, changes could involve. And that is also consistent with the Brown Act. So in my uh, examination of the documents in the back, um, I also have a question about the conflict of interest code changes and would like to ask that the board add in that all commissions must declare ex parte communication. The Planning Commission does that and recently the Historic Resources Commission has been asked to do that. However, the Housing Advisory Commission does not. And there are a lot of uh, industry developers, real estate people that come into those meetings and also contact those commissioners. Some of the commissioners themselves are in the real estate agency and I really think that uh, Housing Advisory Commission needs to not only adopt a, a conflict of interest code, but also the ex parte declaration. I also want to point out to you that the um, Historic Resources Commission, which was uh, changes to their rules were in the first batch, didn't even know about these changes until their October 2nd meeting after your board had looked at them twice and approved them. I would also like to point out that because I attend the County Fire Advisory Commission, they've never seen this. They've never seen this change to their own code. That needs to change. Um, I would like to point out that um, I have concerns about, um, in I think it's section 2.22.010, section B, county council can employ private counsel. I think that's not a good thing unless it is made public who is being employed by county council in the private sector. Um, in the section regarding emergency services, I'm concerned that it deletes the word um, threat of emergency. Um, and regarding um, commissions uh, that are decision-making bodies, I see that the Historic Resources Commission and the Housing Advisory Commission are not listed. And I see that our county no longer has an energy commission. Um, I feel that the wording in the County Fire Advisory Commission is uh, stripping a lot of their power away as Thank what you. happened with the Water Advisory Commission without their Thank knowledge. You. They hadn't seen that either. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you. Anybody else like to address this on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, for your careful reading and critique of that, which is uh, very informative to me and right on the mark. Now, I feel like if we had a board of supervisors that represented the public and um, something was brought forward, and this was with previous board of supervisors, someone would say, wait a minute, we do need to look at the, that. Those are very important points, instead of always just dismissing them. 
Also, uh, I had the same sense when I read this. What are each of these code changes about? Just a, a brief synopsis. I don't think all these changes have to do with uh, typos or um, updates. Why, who ordered this? Why, th this is huge uh, changes. Who directed this? Um, I, I would like to know if you could uh, state here, the person who is assigned to all these code changes, because I would like to have a conversation with him. I think he did a presentation at one of the prior meetings to see uh, what, why, what, what is this about? And whenever I hear the word streamline, that means to me making, from what I've seen, what I've observed, and like with the telecom industry, making it more to facilitate their dominance and their businesses. As with your broadband meeting in Felton last month, Supervisor McPherson, this is imposing harm on the public. So this certainly could be more clear. So those are my comments. I'm very dismayed at the actions of this Board of Supervisors in many respects. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us? Okay, these are um, very minor changes, uh, quite frankly. And we went through this at the last meeting and discussed uh, how minor these changes were. Uh, but I understand that not everybody's going to believe that, and I respect the fact that you can come forward and, and say things, but it doesn't mean that it's actually true. So we'll, coming back to the board, I recognize it's time for a motion with additional direction on something. Yes, I, I would move the recommended actions, uh, direct staff to, to come back with section, um, uh, uh, chapter 2.08, um, when we, uh, with the changes suggested here. Um, uh, at our at the, at the next uh, scheduled um, update of the county code, I understand the motion. Yeah, does it is, is it clear? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's true. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Heath, for coming in and Thank you. presenting that. We'll move on to item 10, which is to consider an ordinance repealing Santa Cruz County Chapter 7.126, the Medical Cannabis Cultivation and Take Related Actions, outlined in the memo of the CAO. Mr. Rain, are you doing the presentation here or the quick discussion here? Welcome. Thank Good you. Good morning. Or, are we afternoon yet? Not quite. Um, so we are here to request the repeal of 7.126 because at this point in time, we feel that the ordinance is no longer necessary. Um, limited immunity is not anything that's recognized by the state under the new laws um, regarding cannabis. And we have a process in place for transition um, that also mirrors um, and helps uh, coordinate with the state process for temporary and provisional licensing. So the people who are registered, we are working with them and um, helping them move through the process of licensing. And the people who aren't registered or aren't participating in any way to get legalized, um, this um, uh, causes, this particular ordinance causes problems for uh, enforcement. Um, leaving 7126 on the books is confusing because we have 7.128 now, which is uh, the law that you passed in May that governs all cannabis operations except for dispensaries, which is 7.130. Uh, and it's confusing for enforcement because enforce, our enforcement team is really relying on 7.128 uh, now for guidance in how to enforce on illegal cannabis operations. Um, this is basically cleanup legislation because 7.128 is now in effect. And so we'd like to request that you repeal 7.126 at this point. Thank you. Are there any questions from board members? Supervisor Leopold. Um, uh, thank you for, for the information and I will be supporting this uh, motion. And we have regularly scheduled updates from the Cannabis Licensing Office. When, was, when will we be receiving the next update from them? Uh, the next update is scheduled for the December meeting. Okay. And there we'll be able to find out how many, you know, you'll, you'll share with us how many people are moving through, um, uh, what's been the enforcement uh, piece like, 
what's our tax uh, receipts looking like. Yes, like you that. gave us very specific instructions on the type of information that you want to receive, and we will be supplying you with all of that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we'll open up to the community. We recognize there's been some people waiting here. I appreciate your patience this morning waiting for this item. Welcome back. Brenda Chadwick, uh, I think most of you know me. I'd like to thank you for your continued uh, emphasis on trying to get the cannabis um, regulated market in the right place for the county. I appreciate what the county's done. All of you, uh, really, I, I, I appreciate it. What I want, hope you, um, when you think of me, when I come up here, I hope you think of that good little angel that sits on your right shoulder um, guiding you to remember all the stakeholders. Uh, in the beginning, the thought was that we were gonna bring in as many people as possible, and unfortunately, I don't know that that's where things are headed, but uh, you all know I have been an advocate for the uh, cottage uh, license type that the state came out with. Unfortunately, it wasn't until May when we passed our final ordinance that that was included. So I want to just continue to remind you about all those small mom and pop heritage cultivators who aren't fitting into the uh, ordinance uh, and how their lives are being dramatically impacted economically. Uh, many are seniors like myself. Uh, and I really want to encourage you to honor those registrations and especially honor the registrations for people who came forward paid their registration fee, did not uh, register anonymously, and started paying their taxes at the very first guidance from the county. And those registrations really need to be honored, even if it takes a little longer than everyone would like. So I hope you do that. Um, I'd like to... Um, Uh, repeat something that uh, Supervisor Leopold said, uh, push for changes from the bottom up. That's what I think we're do we've been doing for quite some time. I want to continue doing that. I hope that um, at some point there'll be a, an opportunity for a, um, a cannabis advisory board so that we can really get some members of the community that aren't part of the county uh, or big business so, uh, uh, to sit down together and look at taxes. Uh, I'd like to uh, encourage the compassionate uh, program where ta ta taxes are not collected from uh, people who contribute to patients at no cost. So I think that's something that's very important. And thank you again for your help and don't be disappointed or uh, worry about me when I come up, just always think of the, the people that uh, are depending on you to make the right choices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> morning, welcome back. Good morning, Jim Coffus from, uh, I'm representing Green Trade Santa Cruz, a coalition of uh, businesses in the county that are um, uh, hoping to be a part of the license regulated uh, statewide market. I trust you all received the uh, communication that I sent uh, with a bunch of issues that we uh, hope that you will uh, begin to address and I'm not gonna go through all those, but I would uh, uh, like to comment about the fact that sitting here today and listening to the uh, Mark Stone's presentation and the Monterey Bay Power presentation and the uh, Beacon Award that you all are gonna go home with. Um, you know, uh, there's a certain amount of pride uh, that I can take as a uh, local resident of Santa Cruz that um, we have a, a, a community and a government that is responsive and is also uh, forward thinking and innovative. And I would encourage you to uh, bring some of that uh, mojo to the cannabis issue. You, you uh, should take a lot of pride in the fact that uh, uh, you've been a leader in the state, that this jurisdiction is, uh, uh, you know, when we travel around the state, we hear uh, nothing but a praise for uh, the way Santa Cruz is moving this uh, forward. Um, 
there's a lot of work still to be done. I mean, we're nine months into this. The, uh, there's a certain amount of chaos going on at the state level. Uh, we're uh, looking forward to a whole set of new rules that are gonna be published sometime this week uh, that will become the permanent rules for, uh, for all the various agencies that are controlling um, uh, commercial cannabis. Uh, there are a lot of issues that are bouncing around that need to be uh, smoothed over and addressed. And so it's really important that you remain vigilant and stay on top of this and be ready to make uh, course corrections uh, to protect uh, the kind of industry that we wanna have in, in this community and to show some leadership to the state on uh, in issues around uh, compassionate use, uh, equity, and, and a whole variety of things that are uh, that are not on the forefront of uh, of the state's agenda. So, please uh, continue to um, keep your eye on this. Continue to uh, demand that uh, you get information, and uh, and let's figure out a way to move forward and make the make the course corrections that are going to be required. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Hi, uh, Pat Malo, a lifetime community member and um, 7.126 expert or captive or however you want to say it. I, I think that I've said those numbers more than I've said any other numbers in my life in sequence. So thank you for that. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember when 7.126 was, you know, formed in these, in by you guys and the community. Um, in a lot of ways, it was a huge step forward and really maybe, um, you know, the best ordinance in a lot of senses that California had at the time. Um, we, myself and others, uh, gathered thousands and thousands of signatures to attempt to protect that ordinance because we thought it was so good, which led to community effort to form an ordinance that would you know, meet the new state requirements and satisfy a bunch of the issues that we had about being a leader with one of the most permissive ordinances at the time. Um, you know, so that ordinance is a mixed bag. Some of the positive things is it created is, is it took a very large industry that was already existing at that time in Santa Cruz um, County because of, again, your history of being leaders on this issue. And it attempted to offer immunity, you know, uh, as best as it could and protect folks who were following those rules. And so we had a large community of people who were following those rules either from Santa Cruz or people who relocated here in a way to be able to follow those regulations. And this, so we had thousands of people following those rules compliant. Then we had a registration period where we had already had what the new zoning, these types of rules were gonna be. Um, and we had 700 folks who thought that they could make it in the new rules enough to pay that money. Um, right now, we are maybe again leading the state of California with the amount of folks who were in this old system that we've transitioned into this new system, but that number is very, very small. I mean, we have close to 30 applications into the cannabis licensing department out of hundreds and hundreds of registries out of thousands of compliant businesses before. And even though that's probably beating the state's numbers of one in 1,000 who has a license, I don't think, you know, 10 in 700, 30 in 700, even 100 in 700 is enough to replace the thousands and thousands and thousands of people who made their living off of medical cannabis in as legal of a way that they were allowed to at the time. And if this was any other industry, I'll finish with the normal joke, is that if it, I remember Wrigley's plant closing and that was corporate bubble gum and everyone threw a fit. And this is what's happened with cannabis. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of rural Aptos. I want to thank the um, three representatives here that have waited so patiently. I would like to urge your board to hold evening meetings when issues like this are being considered. I have been to some of those evening meetings, and this room is packed in the evening when people who are working can attend. So I'd like to ask that you, you grant those people that consideration. And again, thank the people that are here today. I, um, I really want to support um, this county's government working in a cooperative manner with these people who have in good faith come forward and paid a lot of money and, and really put, put themselves out in the light when that was not considered a, a real, when it was a kind of a risky thing to do. I think we've got to support them and especially since this county's budget is relying upon a considerable amount of its revenue from this industry. I want to um, make it clear that I support the people who really are working hard to follow the rules and be environmentally responsible, and I am concerned still that there is a big black market out there. My community has been threatened with uh, fire for three different times now because of these large black market operations. And I, I want it to be uh, supportive of these people who are following the rules and, and doing things in the proper way so they do not impose risk to the communities and the environment. And I want you to be good faith operators, respectful of these people. And finally, um, I want to find out when the new cannabis director will be appointed. Um, I understand Robin Bolster Grant is, is maybe not there anymore. So um, I think it would help um, give confidence to the whole process if there were a person that is in charge and, and can be consistently um, at the helm. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Well, I look, I look forward to the, um, to the uh, report that we'll get in December around a lot of the issues that were uh, discussed in some of the emails we receive, uh, but I think it's important for us to get rid of this relic of our previous system, and I would m move the recommended actions. A motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you both for your work. Uh, before the board goes into closed session, will anything be reportable out of closed session? No. Would anybody from the community like to address us on item 11, which is the closed session item, specifically before we do? Okay. I'd like to thank the Sentinel and Community TV for covering. The board will move into closed session. <laughs>